hey guys, really quickly before I get into this episode today, I briefly mentioned it at the end of my last episode, but I wanted to say it one more time for anybody who missed it or any newcomers coming onto my channel. Around the 50 minute mark is the last story for new stories for this episode. After that will be duplicate or stories I've already told in other episodes previously from around the last three months. I haven't done a big Deep Woods compilation in a while now, so I wanted to do another one of those. So if you don't want to hear previous stories that you've already heard or whatever, that's, that's where that timestamp is. It will be in the description, so if you want to skip that and stop listening after the 50-minute mark or whatever, no hard feelings, totally get it. Just wanted to give you a heads up. All right, I'm going to shut up now. Enjoy the episode. This is a story about three spooky instances that happened in one trip. It's long, but I think it's worth it. My buddy and I still talk about it to this day. So my friend and I took off on a too early season trail run through the Mount Margaret backcountry. The route was a big 30 mile loop. It started out nice, but once we gotten up to the passes, it was obvious we had bitten this off too early. Tons of snow. My friend is not very comfortable on steep snow but we stayed optimistic that the other side of the next pass would be better. Move slow and did this all day. It did not get better. Finally, we got to the final pass, which was a moment of truth. It was steep, and if too snowy would probably mean backtracking, which would mean a night out at this point. I remember hummingbirds buzzing all over the trees around us, which I took as a positive message from the universe. For those that don't really trail run, I'll break it down like this. It's like hiking, except you complete the entire trip at a jog. The intensity is much higher. We carried a single small pack with basic supplies, along with a camelback water pouch. Because of the nature of movement, trail runners typically don't bring a lot with them. We were packed minimally and wearing only what we needed to stay warm. Now, I told you we went out too early. Trail running in the snow is okay. It means you can't get lost because of the backtracking. That being said, it's almost 100% harder than normal trail running. We were past the point of defeat when all of this started to get weird. We crested the pass as the sun started to get low in the sky. Light started to fade as we entered the valley in the final 10 miles. Throughout this time, my friend had been talking about true crime podcasts, joking about all the places to hide a body out here. We were crashing through the overgrown trail, probably the first through it for a year, when a brown tarp caught our eyes through the brush. We paused and looked at one another like, uh, that's about the size of a body. We approached, and we were both physically and emotionally exhausted after the day, saying to ourselves, well, we gotta figure out what this is now. So we prodded it with a trekking pole and found that it was firm, moved the tarp a bit and caught a glance of a red stained fabric. We both go still. I've got major chills now. We move the tarp back and find this big old sleeping bag with red interior fabric. We both laugh and then kept moving. Still, as we keep moving back toward the parking lot, I can't shake the feeling. Why would someone hide a sleeping bag like that? We finally reach the trailhead and my friend's car. It's dark. Were completely exhausted and half delirious. It was an empty lot, except for one other car at the far end. That did make sense. We had seen one other hiker on the trail, far off in the distance. He looked pretty normal. He had your regular hiking pack and gear. As we're getting in his car though, we hear a woman call out from the other car saying, Hello, help. Do you know what kind of bugs are out here? My friend says, let's just get out of here, man. But I find myself sauntering over and find this lady sitting in her overpacked car with the door open. She's like, there's this big bug on my neck. I don't know what it is. It's freaking me out. She's pointing to it, but there's no bug. I tell her, lady, I don't see anything. There's nothing there. But she says, no, come closer. My friend from behind me uh, don't do that, dude. He's got no filter. He's saying it loud enough that both of us can hear him. I tell her, I'd take it off if I were you. Sorry, I can't really help you with that. 
then turn back and get in my buddy's car. He's looking at me like I'm crazy, and honestly, I had no idea why I went over there. I think part of me wanted answers after finding that abandoned sleeping bag. A woman unfamiliar with the area, covered in bugs, vaguely fit the description of our phantom sleeping bag owner. Who else could it be? We don't really discuss it any further, we just take off. We're both depleted, rattled, and ready to get the hell out of Dodge. I felt pretty bad about bringing him along to begin with, but I felt even worse now that things were kind of taking a creepy turn. We just turned on some music and chatted about other stuff going on in our lives. Around five minutes down the road, my friend's flat tire light comes on, and we just look at each other like, oh shit, there's no way this is happening. Fortunately, he had a little pump to plug into his lighter port. We took a guess at which tire was losing air and sat in the silent pitch black, glancing back up the road nervously and waiting for the pump to work. It must have been a half an hour when we realized we got the wrong tire. The one we picked was low, but wasn't losing air. It was the one in the back on the opposite side, slowly deflating and bringing the back end toward the ground. We had just noticed it before it was completely out of air. Great, now we're really stuck for a while. We got the pump moved and situated, watched the slow, tedious process once again. Overhead, the stars started to fade in favor of a shadowy overcast. It was already freezing, but the cloud cover and potential moisture, we just simply weren't prepared for it. My friend was asking if it would rain or snow, and I said no. I checked the forecast every day for a week. This weekend was supposed to be clear. Just as I'm having that thought, the first few flakes of snowy drift come out of the sky and land right on my face. It was beyond demoralizing to see. My buddy's car was a little two-wheel drive SUV. It worked well enough on dirt roads and mild terrain, just that kind of stuff. It definitely wasn't built to pull us out of a few inches of snow, and the pump still had at least an hour left to go. We're getting ready to settle in for the long haul, bundled up in the front seat, the heaters going on full blast, and we hear something. We both turn, one leg in the car and one looking down the road we had just come from. It almost sounded like a cough, and now we can hear footsteps along that muddy road, that schluck, schluck, schluck sound of someone in sneakers walking through the muck. Hello? Help! These bugs are everywhere. It had to be that same tweaked out woman from the trailhead. It was definitely possible. We'd only made it a mile from where we left her. Why she left her car behind was completely beyond us. She had to be on drugs or just crazy to some degree. We also figured that she was living in her car. These were just quick deductions that we made after our encounter, things we didn't think were important. Now all we could say was, who the hell is this lady? We did the only thing that we could do. We got back in the car and locked the doors. The plug-in for the pump snaked through the window that we had partially opened. This way we could keep as much warm as possible inside the car. Now it was a double win. We had a little security from this lady out in the street. We didn't see her at first, but after a minute or two, she came wandering out of the darkness. She walked right by the car, still talking to herself and looking in every direction. She was so out of it, she didn't even realize she passed us, and the car was on so the lighter port would work. It was just so crazy that we both even had to stifle a laugh. Another second or two later and she was gone. It was unbelievable, I couldn't believe our luck. We went back to talking in a whisper. I leaned my seat back and started to zone out, as the late hour and lack of energy was starting to shut me down completely. My buddy and I just kept talking about whatever, and as he spoke, his voice kind of trailed off into silence. I started to speak when I heard it too, those muddy footsteps on the road. The only problem is, they were coming from behind us, from where the lady originally came from. We expected them to be coming further up the road because that's where she walked to. Had she circled around? Maybe there was an offshoot trail that would double her back to us, but whatever the case, we shrank into our seats and waited for whatever or whoever it was. Suddenly our car was lit up by a flashlight. We didn't see anyone walk by, there was just a sudden beam of light cutting down the road. There was a man carrying some stuff. 
and when he saw our car, he started to slow down. It was totally shadowed, so I couldn't really make out any details besides his backpack. My buddy could, though. He leaned over and whispered it was the hiker that we saw earlier. This guy picks up his pace again and comes sprinting over to the car. He looks in the back and then in the front. He had his hands pressed up against the glass, with his flashlight shining through. I'll never forget that big, creepy-ass grin that he gave when he saw us. His eyes lit up, his lips peeled back, and the worst teeth you could imagine were shown. Chipped, rotting right out of this guy's head. Hey, I'm looking for my girlfriend, he shouted through the glass, and I mean shouted. This guy was high as a kite and didn't realize we were only separated by a bit of glass. He was yelling like there was a country mile between us. Thank God my buddy picked up the dialogue. He was way more scared than I was because this weirdo was on his side of the car. He was really close. My friend started talking to buy some time. The first thing that came out of his mouth was that she went walking down the road. Uh, which way? The guy asked. We both pointed down the way she went, literally the only way she could have gone. He nods and looks around, but doesn't move, doesn't even budge an inch. He keeps the conversation going telling us that he stopped out here so he could do a day hike. She wasn't much for outdoors and wanted to stay in the car. He said they had a dog with them, but neither myself nor my buddy ever saw one, not even the back of their dumpy car. The guy goes on and on, telling us he's had a stroke of bad luck lately and haven't found much in the way of work or a place to stay. He goes on and on with what I would consider his whole life story in various stages of yelling speaking with his hands so he's banging on the glass for emphasis, at least starting to scare the daylights out of both of us. That's when he looks down and sees our air pump and cord through the window. His eyes sort of rolled in his head, and his entire demeanor shifts, like he forgot that he was talking to us. He asks if we're having car trouble, to which we reply, it's just a leak, it's almost fixed. He says, no problem, I'm a big car guy. Then he asks if we've seen his girlfriend. She should be somewhere around here. My buddy and I share a look like, oh my god, you've got to be kidding me. The guy starts messing around with the pump, saying he'll make it work better. My buddy and I are almost in hysterics at this point, thinking we'll have to open up the door and confront this guy before he breaks our only way out of the situation. And just as we're getting ready to do just that, we hear a crazy, blood-curdling scream rip through the air. The snow was starting to ramp up, and now, something was screaming bloody murder out in the darkness. Weaker guy on her back tire stands up and looks around, then starts booking it in the direction of his girlfriend, yelling her name as he goes. My friend and I sat in total silence for the next 45 minutes, until we feel like the tires aired up enough to drive on. The whole time we're looking in every direction, expecting one or both of these psychos to come screaming out of the trees. Thankfully, neither of them did. We loaded up the pump and hit the road sometime around 9 p.m., a full three hours later than I wanted. We saw them one last time right before we got off that dirt road. They were standing before a thicket of trees, either holding hands or pushing each other, we couldn't really tell. All we could see was their arms were stretched toward one another. Just as we hit the pavement and started to slog back to town, we heard them both start screaming their heads off. By far the scariest hike of my life. And to those crank bug weirdos, I don't ever want to see you again. I was hiking in the Issaquah foothills a couple of winters back on a weekday. The Issaquah Alps see a lot of traffic year round. But on this particular gloomy day, during working hours, there weren't a lot of people on those trails. This is exactly what I was looking for. Pure isolation in the beautiful backcountry. My hike involved connecting two neighboring parks, separated by a road. Once you exit the first park, you cross the road over to the second park's parking area and the trailhead. When I reached the parking area, I noted a few cars in the lot and started my way up the trail. I hadn't gotten far when I heard a guy start calling out from behind me. Hey, hey, excuse me. He was trying to get my attention, but in a typical Seattleite fashion. 
I had no interest in talking to strangers and just decided to pretend I didn't hear him. Hoped he would go away. He didn't go away though. He proceeded to follow me up the trail and kept yelling. Hey, hey, sir, hey. I probably could have lost the guy, but it felt just kind of silly to run away for no real reason. So he picked up his pace to a jog and got closer. I stopped, turned around and said something like, Yeah, what, what's up? He stopped at a distance from me where he didn't really need to yell, but had to speak loudly to hear one another. Not a normal conversation distance. For me though, this was okay because I mentioned this whole interaction was pretty annoying. I got out here to be alone with nature, not to get harassed just outside the parking lot. Were you just taking pictures of my car? He asked. I was taken aback by his question since I had no idea who this guy was. What? I asked him. I saw you. You were taking pictures of my car. He went along. In my mind, I made the connection he must have been parked in the lot below, hanging out in his car. I had my phone out earlier, when I was in the parking area, consulting the trail map, and I guess he thought I was taking photos. So I explained to him that I was just looking at my map, and he seemed to be satisfied with that answer. He then paused for a moment, looked down as if he was in contemplation, then looked back up at me and asked, Have you been following me? My heart started to beat a little faster now. Something off about this guy. This made no sense whatsoever, as he was in fact currently following me. It was also at this moment where my confusion turned to tension, as I realized this person was not mentally well. The way he asked me this question was super intense and accusatory. It made me feel for a moment that I might need to defend myself against this guy. So I did my best to defuse the situation, explaining in a non-threatening way that I was simply out on a hike. I don't even know who you are. This also seemed to satisfy him and settle him down. He goes on a little bit of a tangent and tells me how someone had been harassing him on Facebook. He didn't know who it was. I don't really remember all the details, but I think that was the gist of it. I didn't have much to say, and he ended up just saying, well, don't take pictures of people's cars, before turning around and heading back down the trail. I watched him make his own descent before turning back to my own adventure. The rest of the day passed as a relatively normal. Saw some cool critters, snapped a few pictures, and just did the general outdoor thing. By noon, I'd put some miles behind me, lost sight of any other hiker. I broke small camp for a little rest and recharge, ate lunch just before pushing onward for another hour or so. After a bit, the cold started to get to me. The wind was cutting through my jacket. My hands were starting to fail. The sun was perfect for a downhill climb at this point. It's clear navigation. The trail is mostly exposed through the snow. Or it's covered from the shade. My boot prints clearly mark the path. When I reached my spot for lunch, I considered stopping for a second time, but decided against it. I just wanted to get back to my car. As I'm moving through the little camp, something catches my eye. My track marks where I'd come from, where I stopped and where I went, but there seems to be a different set of tracks cutting through the area. And sure enough, after a little more inspection, it is a second set of tracks, who prints a little bigger than mine. They came up the slope, loitered in the camp, and then wandered back the same way that I went earlier. Spooky, but not the strangest thing, I guess. It is a local outdoor area, a well-trafficked trail system, all the stuff that attracts day packers. The strangest part was, I didn't encounter this person on my way back down the trail, and by the direction of their tracks, they were on the same trail that I was using. I should have crossed paths with them at some point on my return journey. I pushed on down the mountain where the tracks just got weirder and weirder. It looked like they walked up and down the trail multiple times, as the boot prints faced both directions. I tightened up my pack straps, my belt, and everything in my bang around just in case I needed to run. My mind naturally went back to that stranger who'd followed me up the path that morning. I reached a part of the trail that overlooked the very long stretch of the valley ahead. I could see close to a mile of the path laid out before me, switching back every now and again, with pockets of trees and snow melt here and there. Everything looked bright and muted at the same time. I take in the view for a few more seconds and that's when I see him. 
There's a man way off down the hill, close to a half mile by my guess. It was hard to see at first, just standing still amongst some trees. He was looking up at me, or at least in the direction of the hilltop. As we're looking at each other, I see him slowly slink into some bushes and hide himself along the path. What the hell is going on? I was relatively chilled out, but in the blink of an eye, my heart was racing and a cold sweat was pouring down my face. Even with the distance, it looked like that weirdo that accosted me earlier. The simple clothing, the lack of gear, pullover sweater instead of a real jacket. I mean, who else could it be? More pressing though, how the hell was I gonna get back to my truck? I looked around the terrain and shrugged. The only option was this trail system. The snow and mud made everything off the path way too treacherous. If I had to run, he'd catch me quickly through the wilderness. I took a deep breath and continued down the mountainside. Not many will agree with this, but I don't carry much in the way of self-defense when I'm out in the wilderness. No walking poles, no bear spray, and definitely not a gun. I've hiked my whole life and never had needed to use anything of that sort. What I do carry, though, is a medium-sized fixed blade hunting knife. I consider it a tool above all else, but obviously it's a reliable means of security. I unclasped the sheath strap so I could pull it out quickly if I needed to. Nothing happened for quite some time. I walked on. I did my best to enjoy the dwindling views, all while keeping an eye out for wherever this guy could be. I navigated the entire valley, including the tree line that I saw him near, but there wasn't any sign of him. This gave me a little confidence and helped me keep going. I even braved a few shortcuts through brambles where I could shave off a few steps. There's one part of the trail where it weaves through a small boulder field. It's nothing crazy, but there is one brief scramble between some rocks. As I'm making my way through the stonework, I hear this sound behind me, and not any sound from the natural world, but something you could hear in the city, in a suburban area, the unmistakable shutter click of a camera. I stopped. Hands extended before me on the boulder face as I shuffled along. I slowly turned and looked behind me, but there was no one there. I kept looking, and finally, up in the stones, I saw him. It was that weirdo from earlier, just as I thought. He had his phone out with the camera pointed at me. He's got this creepy look on his face. Dead, shark eyes, no emotion. A half snarl on his lips. Not very nice, is it? He called down to me. I don't know why, but something boiled up inside me, and I would compare it to rage. Being followed, stalked, and now having photos taken of me. I didn't like being made to feel victimized when I hadn't done anything wrong to this guy. He climbed down, slowly, while snapping a picture of me every few feet. Finally, I asked this guy what his problem was. You! You've been following me, and I'm going to figure out why. He screamed at me. By this point, I had enough. I explained that I don't know you, I've never met you, and I would never waste my time following you. I then went on in explicit detail that I was ahead of him, therefore couldn't be following anyone. The guy just continued to shake his head, argue with me, and snap random pictures. By this point, he made it down the trail but was still 25 feet from me. The argument continues to escalate till he finally picks up a rock and hurls it at me. It doesn't hit me, but it's fist size, so it comes pretty close. I can tell by his facial expression that he liked the results, so he starts to pick up a second stone. As he does that, I pulled out my hunting knife from my belt and start charging back down the path toward him. The sun hits the steel. The guy's entire expression changed. Now it was me who liked the result of my actions. At this point, I just started hurling threats back at him. I said this was perfect, being so far out here. No cops, no one to see what was about to happen. This obviously scared the shit out of him. He starts backing away, hands up, saying, All right, all right, all right, all right, over and over again. He started huffing it back up the mountain, saying all kinds of crazy stuff like how I better not follow him anymore or he'll call the police. I waited, watched him trundle up the hillside before turning back to my own journey. I didn't have any more issues after that and never saw that guy again. Or to the wise, though. In order to communicate with crazy, you gotta talk crazy. Having encountered many bears, coyotes, and mountain goats in the wilderness, this was the only moment 
although brief, I felt threatened on the presence of those trails. This was more of a bushwalk, but when I was a teenager, I lived near a very long creek trail in an empty bushland. Beautiful place, very hilly and mountainous area with rainbow lorikeets and a dam nearby. My friend and I headed to the creek after school because I wanted to show her a bat colony near that trail. I don't remember if I turned left when we had to turn right or if we turned right when we should have turned left. But either way, we never found that colony. This was well before smartphones, so we just followed the creek aimlessly for a couple of hours, hoping it would end somewhere familiar. It might also be important to note that we're both female. It was getting dark when we first saw it, a flash of red in the bushes. We have Rosellas out here, but she swore that it wasn't a bird. We heard rustling now and again, which made us walk faster. It was tough to move fast on that terrain though, because the slope along the creek was getting steeper. Embedded in the creek bed were sometimes these huge concrete cylinders, big enough to stand inside. Some of them had water flowing through them, and some didn't. Soon after she saw that red flash, we spotted something on the other side of the creek. It was one of those big concrete cylinders, but there was something inside. At first, we thought it was garbage, but it was a home. We could make out the blankets, a shopping trolley full of miscellaneous items, and a newspaper magazine cut out hanging on the concrete walls, mostly of girls. We came to a stop and just stared inside that little shelter. I remember having this sinking feeling in my stomach, like I was seeing something no one was supposed to see. Suddenly, we were aware of a dirty smell in the air, like body odor, and the fading sunset behind us. Just as I'm getting ready to speak, my friend grabs my wrist and jerks my arm. She's pointing to the tunnel where a red light has come out of. We watch in horror as it slowly moves outward from the tunnel, and as it does, we can make out the silhouette of a person hobbling in the cylinder. They're holding a small hand light of some kind, a keychain clicker with a red bulb, long stringy hair, oversized clothes, and the creepy way that they shuffled along had us all but petrified. When they got to the edge of that cylinder, the person stopped and pointed the light right at us. It didn't breach us, but it showed that they knew we were there. We started to take a couple of steps down the trail when another light comes to life, this one above the cylinder and in the tree line. A third one follows, down by the edge of the creek. The two new ones start to converge towards the light in the tunnel. One of them, I think the man in the tunnel, called out and asked what we were doing. We replied back with nothing, just exploring the waterways and looking for bat hollows. We really needed to get home, and the hour just got away from us. We heard snickering, then muted footsteps. The trickling of the creek made everything sound further away than it really was. It also helped to carry the noises away. I briefly wondered how long these sickos had heard us coming down the trail. There's a load of bats right back in here, the guy in the tunnel said. He was waving us toward him in the dim light. My friend and I were still taking small steps back the way we came, back toward home. We said no thank you, we had to get home before our parents called the police. That only brought on more snickering. I started to feel claustrophobic, even though there was a creek between us. The man in the tunnel went on to say that there was no police presence out here, that we were much further from town than we originally thought. That's all we needed to hear. My friend leaned over and whispered something like we needed to run and we needed to do it now. Since it was dark, I snatched up her hand and tore off for home. Just as we start sprinting, all those men start hooting and hollering, telling us not to go. They'll show us the quickest way back. When I decided to look back, just in case, I did see another light come to life. This one was on our side of the creek, where we were just standing. Just as my lungs were starting to burn from the sudden motion, see the red light start chasing after us. It takes me a second to realize that I'm not running anymore, but also screaming at the top of my lungs. So is my friend. We're running like lightning, pumping so fast it almost doesn't feel real. The screaming has cut off our airflow. We can't maintain the speed that we're at. 
Meanwhile, we can hear the creep behind us, mimicking our screams, shining his red light back and forth. The illumination is proof that he's gaining on us. A little bend comes up in the road, and I consider bustling through the bushes rather than lose speed on the turn. It doesn't matter though, we aren't fast enough. All of a sudden, I feel a jerk behind me as the guy snatches up my friend by her other wrist. We both start to stop, screaming now even louder. When we feel a big pair of hands collide with our backs and throw us into the dirt. We hit the ground hard, knocking the wind out of us and everything. We both gave up at that point and assumed we were dead. Nothing happened though. We laid there, listening to the pounding footfalls of someone running away. As they faded, we looked up from the dirt to see only darkness. The shock of being attacked started to fade and being all alone. All we could do was cry. We crawled to our feet and dusted one another off then started jogging down the trail again. We didn't say anything to one another, but saved our breath instead. We didn't want a chance being heard anymore. There was rustling behind us now and then, which could have been anything, I guess. Plenty of wildlife in that area of the bushland. It was maybe 30 minutes to an hour later when we saw our wire fencing, followed it to some kind of garbage yard in an industrial area. It turned out that we were three and a half hour walk from our original starting point. I'm still not 100% of what happened that day, other than the fact that my friend was grounded for a month. We told our parents about what happened, which they blew a gasket, as expected. They alerted the authorities, who explained to us that there were undesirables that lived far up that waterway. There was nothing they could really do about it. To this day, I don't go hiking without a good sense of where I'm at. First, I will say I'm 100% in favor of sending teen girls out into the wilderness. This trip, as disturbing as it was, was the end of my childhood and the beginning of my young adulthood. I think all women should be given a chance to take real risks and make serious decisions. I was at a similar camp in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. We were a group of 10 girls, ages 13 to 14. I had two counselors, which were ages 18 and 19. This trip was supposed to be a 14-day cross-country hiking trip deep into the backwoods. We had a couple of stashes of water that had been dropped along our route, but otherwise, everything we needed was on our backs. About 10 days into our hike, we were looking forward to a legendary aspect of this trip, which older campers had told us about. We would spend a day alone in the woods, on a solo. This was a cool all-day excursion wherein the counselors dumped each camper into an isolated area. For 10 hours or so, we had to fend for ourselves. We were all very excited at the prospect of being truly self-sufficient for a little while. I went into my solo with my full kit, including a tent, with the exception of cooking supplies. My counselor hiked out with me to a sandy bank overlooking a pond, gave me a high five, and told me she'd be back to collect me around 6 p.m. for dinner. I had a small journey and some embroidery to entertain myself with. After days and days of hard marches across sandy and uneven terrain, and about a billion giggly conversations with the other girls, I really actually looked forward to some rest and some quiet. I wrote a few letters to friends and family back home, even jotted down a little poem about the nature around me. I remember eventually getting bored and deciding to take a nap. When I woke up, it was late afternoon. I was surprised that my counselor hadn't already come back to get me. Within an hour, I started to get really worried. It was getting dark, and once it got dark in an era before GPS, I knew that my counselors might not find me. It was also getting colder now that the sun was gone. I hadn't collected any firewood or dug a fire pit. I was caught with my pants down, and it was too late to do anything about it. I opened up my pack and looked at my supplies. I didn't have enough water, so I had to deal with that first, filling my flask with pond water and dropping in some emergency iodine tablets to clean it. I did have enough calories in the form of trail mix, which was nice. I had limited matches, so I decided to conserve those. I pitched my tent, changed into my warmer clothes, and then, wearing my headlamp and parka, 
I bundled myself up in my tent. I had a disgusting but satisfying meal of iodized pond water and trail mix. Then I poured over the map of my location. I was very, very acutely aware of the fact that I was a 14-year-old girl with limited orienting experience who just might need to start a solo hike out of Michigan backwoods first thing in the morning. Then I heard something outside my tent. Instinctually, I killed my flashlight and held my breath, listening for it once more. It sounded like footsteps along the shore of the pond below camp. The shore was cropped up with rocks and shale, so anything moving down there would be pretty loud. After a minute or two, I heard it again, crunching footfalls. My fear dissipated though. I realized it was my camp counselor. She'd overshot my camp and wandered toward the pond. I unzipped my tent and stepped out into the chilly mountain air. A big, bright moon welcomed me, cast shadows all throughout the wilderness. There was no sign of anyone though, not in the trees or near the pond. That's when something exploded down by the pond in front of me. It was so loud that I couldn't even process it. But after a second, I realized that it was a gunshot. I could see the water spray shooting up into the air from the impact of the bullet. My ears were ringing. My heart was pounding, so I thought I was going to pass out. There was someone out here shooting a gun in the pond. I didn't fully understand the gravity of the situation, but I knew this was dangerous and I was unequipped to handle it. Before I could start to come up with some kind of plan, another gun blast exploded in front of me. This time I could see the flash from the barrel and the person holding the gun. They were standing on a stump just outside the water. Regretting my decision to leave my tent, I climbed back inside and zipped it up as quietly as I could. I scooted into the back corner and tried to make myself as small as possible. Soon I could hear talking, what sounded like two men muttering down by the water. It occurred to me, the only reason they didn't know that I was there was because I didn't make a campfire. My decision to save my matches might have saved my life that night. I heard them laughing, talking, then laughing again. It sounded like they were getting closer, perhaps climbing the cove up to the campsite. The shale gave way to soil and I could almost feel their steps shaking through the earth. Once they got to the top, I could hear them clearly now. They loaded up the gun and fired a couple of more times into the water below. I could see the muzzle flash from inside my tent and their long silhouettes cast against it. After they emptied the gun, they started climbing back down to the pond shore. I had no idea where these guys could have come from. Maybe there was a dispersed camping area on the other side of the valley, and that path led back to the pond. Next, I heard a woman holler, kind of yell, then a loud splash in the water. I could hear her treading and splashing and swimming around. The guys whistled and shouted some vague encouragement. I turtled up the best I could and tried not to lose it, as it only got weirder from there. There was a distant conversation between the three, the sound of the swimming and then the sound of what I could only describe as a stampede. There wasn't any commotion near me or my tent, but I could hear the thunder of their hooves. I didn't know if it was cattle or horses, all I do know was that it was deafening. Next came more gunfire, 10 or 15 bright flashy discharges exploded. I could almost hear drums or whooping of some kind, but with the over sounds mixed in, it was hard to tell. My ears were ringing so bad that I covered them with my hands. Then it was all over. The stampede, the hollering, the gunfire, it just vanished. I got up from where I was laying and waited for something else to happen. All I could hear was the same hushed talking from before, down by the water. The voices sounded a little different this time though, but soon they were gone too. Next thing I knew, I passed out in my sleeping bag from the adrenaline dump. Luckily, shortly after the first morning light, I woke up to my counselor Sarah calling my name. I jumped out of my tent and ran into her powerful bear hug. I'd never been happier to see another person. She told me that another one of the campers had injured herself seriously, cutting herself deeply on a sharp rock. Both counselors had to carry her back to camp. Sarah had then needed to hike out a certain amount of miles to radio for backup, while the other counselor 
stayed with the injured camper. By the time they'd handled the situation, it was nearly dark. They'd managed to collect most of the campers, but I'd been too far away from the camp to reach me safely. They knew I was well equipped, and not a lot of nervous temperament. I was one of the campers they decided to leave at their solo camps overnight. When I told her what had happened to me, her eyes bulged out of her head. She asked me to clarify what I was saying, to which I did, and she began apologizing profusely. This probably came from a sense of guilt and worry, but also because she could lose her job, I'm sure. She said they didn't hear anything like that that I described during the night, and they were only three quarters of a mile away. Surely they would have heard all that gunfire. The injured girl ended up being just fine. I'm told she developed an extremely cool scar from that incident. All I can really say about my incident is that I'm really glad I didn't have to hike out alone, but also quite proud that I kept my shit together and did what I needed to do to stay safe while alone in the woods. Whoever was out there may have meant me no harm, simply just didn't even know I was there. That stampede was a whole other experience that I just chalked up to some kind of natural phenomena. There are plenty of animals in the woods, and the repeated discharge of a gun like that might be enough to get them all moving. Whatever the case, I came out of it alive and well, if not a little braver for it. I went with my brother and mother on a hiking trip from Poland to Russia. The first few days were pretty great, with some minor clashes with bad weather. As we arrived at the Russian border, we needed to take a bus to cross it because no pedestrians are allowed to cross the border without a vehicle. After a bit of a hassle, we started out on our day on the Russian side of the border with our planned route in mind and a much shorter time frame to get it done, thanks to some visa problems and other passengers in our bus. We walked over to the main road that crossed the oblast that we hiked through. At a small village, our mother had the brilliant idea to give my brother all the money she withdrew when we arrived, in the most blatant, obvious way. She handed him this money in plain view of a cluster of Russian soldiers, who had a reputation for swindling travelers in outlier villages. One of the soldiers happened to be questioning my brother about his visa while this happened. The soldier, who was probably as confused as my brother and I were, started to interrogate us a bit harsher than before in this more serious tone. He asked about more concrete data and details of our visa, all of things that were cleared thankfully, and we got to continue our hike. Still, I won't forget looking behind me and seeing that same cluster of soldiers walking us out of town. They were smoking cigarettes under a light drizzle of rain. None of them looked pleased to see us go, especially now that they knew we were traveling with large sums of cash. Guard work doesn't pay well unless you jam up the people passing through or whatever valuables that they might have. As we continued on, we had to go off the main street, which had no footpath but a huge shoulder that was pretty convenient to walk on, reach our overnight stay. The road got gradually smaller as we followed it, finally turning into a small mud path before the first few houses of another village. At a field which we had to follow, we were greeted by some farmers that were currently on a break from harvesting. They asked us where we were going and told us with gestures of swimming hands that continuing this path might not be the best idea. We, in hindsight, sadly, did not care because there was no rivers or other sources of water that could stop us. As we continued our journey, the vegetation around us grew more and more the further that we went. The supposed road that we were on suddenly turned into an overgrown path, which we had lost for a short amount of time because it basically wasn't really a path anymore. We followed the knee-high meadows next to it for a few hundred meters, until we finally realized that the forest next to us was indeed the path. It was more overgrown than the forest in Poland, or the rest of Europe for that matter. As we continued along this forgotten alleyway, the vegetation switched from dry underwood to six-foot-tall stinging nettle. I wore jeans because, whereas it might be heavier, it's much safer for this exact reason. My brother and mother were wearing shorts and sleeveless shirts, totally unprepared for such an encounter. Worse yet, I did a double take at the tall grass and thought I saw a face in the plants. It was a woman, dirty wrapped in cloth to protect from the nettle. Once we made eye contact, 
she disappeared deeper into the thicket. Now that I inspected it, the stinging nettle was really only one lane. It surrounded the trees to the brush further back. I called out for the others to watch themselves. There is vagrants living in the forest. It isn't uncommon to be robbed blind on a cross-country backpacking trip. We tightened up our belongings and walked in spinning circles to keep an eye on every angle. They followed us for a mile or two, but never gained on any of our stuff. We had to admit, hanging around in those stinging nettle was a perfect idea for a bandit. If you could protect yourself from the acid rash, you were damn near invincible, as nothing could chase you through such an overgrowth. We had only lucked out because I had just happened to see that woman before they could jump us. We did not turn around because it was the only road that led directly out of the village for our stay. We continued on for another 10 kilometers until we reached a road that crossed our nettle path. After we saw the street, I opened up our street map. This is normally my trustworthy source to find a good hiking trail if no printed maps of the region are available. It said that the road should significantly improve over the next kilometer or two. It definitely did not. The underwood went from mildly annoying to actively troubling us. Two times on our path, we had to cross small streams. There were bridges. Sadly, they were torn down a few years prior to us hiking out there, so we had to climb down the embankment, walk through eight foot tall plants at the bottom, and cross the really small yet inconvenient stream just to get to the other side, where we had to climb up to our path yet again. This part was a little scary, because we had to potentially offload some of our equipment to climb down. We could still see some of the highway bandits lingering along the tree line. Anytime we set anything on the ground, they came strolling over like it was their property. It was kind of mind boggling to watch them. The moment we snatched our things off the ground, they would spin around and march right back into the trees. At some point, a few hours shortly before sunset, the road finally turned into a walkable path again. My brother finds a coin from 1920 right in the middle of the trail. This made it clear that there weren't many users of this road, and also told us that the vagrants weren't likely to follow us anymore, since there's just money lying around. We were only two kilometers away from a much more trafficked roadway when we hit this fence, a very high one. It not only crossed the path, but seemed to run in both directions for as far as we could see. There was a sign that said it was an enclosed deer habitat, and travel would not be possible in this direction. We took the only option that we had, started walking around the fenced area, hoping it would lead us around to where we could pick up our trail again. We were worried the fencing would lead us out of the Russian border though, as we had only really walked a few kilometers. There was a forest ahead, and soon the fence led us straight into it. The little path that we followed along the fence quickly turned into nothing. We did encounter spurts of walkways where the fence had needed a little maintenance in the past, but beyond that, it was bushwhacking. Our luck continued to get worse as that fence suddenly led us right into a river. Then it followed it for the better part of a kilometer. We had to cling to the fencing and plant materials too, just to stop ourselves from falling into the water. Our hands were absolutely ruined by the end of it. As the fence turned away from the river and the shrubs, the trees got denser and denser until we could not walk directly next to the fence anymore but along the free spots in between the trees. At this time, it was night already. My brother was leading us with a flashlight through the thicket, only a few meters per minute. After enough stress and time spent along this fence, we finally were fed up and decided that illegally crossing that deer enclosure was safer than walking through this forest for who knows how long. We let my brother climb over the fence, then gave him all of our backpacks. Then he and my mother climbed over it as well. After a small check of ourselves, we realized that we'd somehow lost some minor things in the forest, like a plastic water bottle and a rain cape. We were fine besides some nettle stings and just pure exhaustion. The walk along that deer enclosure was a leisure, especially because the full thing had an interior road system that was way easier to get access to. We silently followed the path to the farmer's house, which we definitely did not want to disturb at that time. We were just some random hiking trespassers on our way to accommodations on the other side of the property. It didn't matter though. The farmer caught sight of us moving between fields and we heard him start hollering for us to leave. 
We answered kindly, saying that we were just hiking through to the next town and would leave immediately. This wasn't good enough though, because the next thing we hear is the report of a rifle and the bullet whistling through the crops. This crazy Russian farmer was shooting into his own plants, so our only option was to run. He fired a few more times, but the growth was so dense he didn't have an idea of where to aim. We left him behind at the cost of all of our energy. As we followed the road, we finally reached that village and searched for our guest house in its respective neighborhood. As you can guess from our prior luck, it wasn't there. The guest house itself wasn't a fraud, but somehow misadvertised as the wrong address. The real place was 12 kilometers across town. Normally that wouldn't really be a deal breaker, but at this point, our trip and all the exhaustion, we just called it a day and bowed out. We walked to a small train station that luckily had a small waiting cabin next to pure nothingness. We tried to sleep there until the next day when the first train would arrive. To skip at least that last 40 kilometers and get directly to the township. After the stinging nettle, the long distance, the thieves, the border patrol, and the shooting farmer, we were desperate for everything to just be over. All of that struggle, and we didn't even make it. We were fortunate though. We didn't get kidnapped, robbed, or murdered by any locals. I'm proud of my brother, who was able to hold up such a distance with a swollen knee from a prior incident, as well as my mother who already proved that she can hike 700 kilometers upward in one tour. It was an eye-opening experience, the kind that tells you what kind of person you are, but I definitely wouldn't recommend it to anyone. My family used to go camping with a few groups of friends when I was a kid. A bunch of us would get together, plan a weekend and then caravan out into the middle of nowhere together. This allowed kids whose parents weren't able to make it because there were so many adults in attendance. It was like a self-generated summer camp type of setting. We were always safe, well provided for, and having monumental fun out in the bush. I remember one Christmas when I was about five. We were camping out in the bush. I'd been on several trips by then and felt keen on all the festivities. I considered myself a veteran of the outback. Dad let me start my own small fire, roast my own food, even pick my own bedtime. These camping trips were very special memories for all of us. We grew into ourselves without the bustle of the cityscape back home. For those who don't know, the bush is some of the harshest, most isolated terrain in the world. It's unforgiving backcountry, arid, and undeveloped scrubland. It's hot, waterless, and everything is prepared to kill you, even the plants and the prey. We didn't worry about that though. Our parents brokered the camping so we never dealt with anything dangerous. They weren't survival experts, but they knew the ins and the outs of being isolated. Very few trips ever resulted in mishaps or any injuries. There were nine kids in total in our campsite, we weren't allowed to wander through the bush. Parents would give us a walkie-talkie to tell us when to come back to camp. We never wandered far, but this was definitely my favorite part of the entire trip. It felt like we were part of a special operations team or on some kind of mission through the Badlands. Others would gather the rest of our tools, hand shovels, compasses, a small tarp for cover. We weren't touring the camping spot. We were in another world in our heads. I imagine we looked pretty outfitted as we roamed around, despite being so tiny. Between the nine of us, the oldest was probably eight years old. It was imagination at its finest, and our parents would only fan the flames. They'd periodically come over the walkie-talkie, pretending to be base camp or the rescue chopper, whatever fit the game that we were playing. I don't remember what game was that day, but we hadn't made contact with the parents in quite a while. We'd actually gone a little further than normal, or feeling cheeky when the walkie-talkie started to crackle. We all gathered around and waited for the message. Slowly, someone began speaking to us through the speaker, writhed in static. It was a man's voice. He said that he was Santa, and he was trying to find us to give us our presents. We asked him where he was and how we could find him. We're all bug-eyed, staring at the radio between us. 
It made sense to our little brains. Of course, Santa was on across the radio waves. He traveled the whole world. He needed comm links to make a journey like that. I'm out here and I, I know I'm close to you, he said. I can hear all of you, not far off. Why don't you just keep going north until you see me? We looked down at our equipment. Despite our lack of outdoor skills, we actually had the compass and we knew which way that was. Again, this was the furthest out we'd ever been, so we decided to make contact with the grown-ups first. Surely, they'd want to come along and meet Santa too. Thinking back, I wonder if we collectively kind of knew this was too good to be true. Either way, we were excited. We all ran back to our campsite, screaming that we just made contact with Santa. The parents laughed at us as he crowded back into the camp, but we didn't let up. We were adamant that Santa had just come over the walkie-talkie. He wanted us to come and find him. Some of the parents settled us down and questioned us directly and specifically. Who contacted who over the radio? What exactly did he say? Did you tell him where you're staying? Your name? Where you live? How long did he talk to you for? They went on and on, and we excitedly, almost annoyed, answered all the questions. Didn't they understand? Santa Claus was waiting somewhere, just through the scrub brush. They told us what was really going on. That wasn't Santa. It was some outback dwelling weirdo who was probably within a mile or two. We only partly understood what they were saying. It was nuanced because they had to keep the illusion of Santa being real in place, while still explaining that the voice we heard was a dangerous stranger who wanted to lure us into the wilderness. The walkie-talkie was taken off of us, and we weren't allowed to go anywhere for the rest of that trip. We were all pretty devastated at the time. But I understand the seriousness of it, and the creepiness of it, now looking back as an adult. I remember overhearing them talk about it later that night. They honestly didn't know what to make of all of it. It could have been another camper just having some honest fun with some kids over the radio. The reality was, they didn't know, and couldn't risk finding that out. We changed camping locations after that trip for obvious reasons. What really shook them up was that they didn't even hear the guy. We were all tagged to do the same frequency. So when his voice came out over our speaker, it should have come out over the adult speaker too, but it didn't. Somehow that guy spoke directly to us and only us and invited us to come find out why. I've spent countless hours inside the deep woods. I've seen a lot of weird, semi-spooky stuff, but it usually has a pretty round and reasoned truth behind it. I've heard even stranger stuff, stuff I thought people just made up for clout. I don't entertain a lot of what I would consider nonsense. This is the only time, the only few seconds, that goes down as truly inexplicable for me. I distance hike when I can, Sometimes this means getting up early or staying out late to get as many miles in as possible. It's a strenuous hobby that not everybody understands, but those that do get the commitment. Get to see views and terrain not many do. Get to breathe air untouched by industry. Get to swim in waters people aren't constantly pissing in. It also stands as some of the best full body exercise a person can do. Did I mention it's therapeutic? But I digress. Sometimes though, Walking in the pitch dark with a low light headlamp gets spooky. Hands free just in case something comes barreling out of the darkness trying to rip my face off. I don't believe in the paranormal, but bears and cougars are real life predators. On deep hikes, creatures like these are much nearer to us than we know. In the dark with the headlamp, every odd scratch or rustle in the underbrush feels like a certain death. It's the only part of distance hiking that makes me anxious, but still, it's part of the hobby. I grew up in the woods of this area. I've slept under canopy of stars more nights than I can count. I've trekked thousands of miles in trail, riverbank, lakeshore, ridge, bottoms, bogs, and creeks. I've hunted the game. I'm establishing this because it's important you understand. I've heard, seen, and smelt all about this region that it has to offer in way of wilderness. That woodland was my house and I knew every room and railing. My scariest experience happened at about 4.30 in the morning. It was a late spring in the same woodland, 
so the first morning light wouldn't be visible in the treetops for another 30 to 45 minutes. Another hour past that until sunrise. I was on mile five, barely breaking a sweat. I'm waiting to hit caffeine so I don't burn out too early in my journey. There's a chill blanketing the whole forest. That wet, almost misty kind of spring morning. Definitely common for the area that I'm in. I'm in a low bottom that's wedged between two steep ridges. The trail I'm on was narrow, muddy, and completely hemmed by a thick underbrush, young maple, and old oat growth. I'm focused on the small light from my headlamp, just one step after the other, zoned out. Exercise is the goal when it's dark, as there definitely isn't anything to look at. I just stay focused and make sure I don't blow out a knee or get bit by something. Then, I hear a loud crack. I froze solid. It was a crazy sound to hear five, six miles into the wilderness in the still ripening dawn. It was something I, for the first time in a long time, have never heard before. This is the part I have trouble describing. 4.30 a.m. in the springtime means I'm the only thing making noise. No birds chirping, nothing, dead quiet. Even the nocturnal animals are getting ready to go to sleep, making for a weird overlap out there where nothing stirs at all. It's a supreme silence and usually when hunters tend to do their stalking, it's the best time to get into position while everything is resting before sunrise. Mid-step, I froze. When fight or flight kicks in, you have these immediate instinct thoughts. The thought that instantly flashed in my mind as soon as I stood there balancing myself into silence was, if I hear that again, I'm turning around. I'm going all the way back I came in a hurry. That was the only logical option out there. Why? Because that sound was not a branch breaking. It wasn't deadfall. It wasn't a widow maker. I was damn sure that I heard something intentional. Hearing it twice, well, that meant get out of here. That meant something territorial to me. Like a snake shaking its rattle, letting you know it's time to fuck off. I wasn't in a position to try and route myself around something that didn't want me out there. I had a headlamp strapped to my head that gave my position to whoever was out there. To describe it as best I can, it sounded like a decent sized wooden stick being violently whacked against a small tree. More a fungo sized bat stick than a baseball bat. The distinction in my head being that this sound was a crack, not a thud or a thump. And I've described it as explosive in the past because it was so sudden and so terribly loud. I had the sense that it was about 50 yards directly in front of me, loud and clear. Now as I stood there, completely spooked, I realized the soon to be worst part of my situation. I knew where the sound came from. I knew where the trail went. In about 30 yards, I was gonna come to a 180 degree turn and start up the ridge going away from the creek. This meant, as soon as I got the courage to move toward that noise, I was gonna have to turn my back to it to get up that ridge. This made me very nervous. My head is somewhere between methane murderer and some kind of animal pulling my guts out of my ass. Minutes pass. I just breathe my foggy breath into my glasses and listen. Nothing. Dead quiet. I've got 20 to 30 minutes until first light. I crank up the headlamp and start to slowly creep the 180 turn. When you wear a headlamp in the woods at night, every tree branch in front of you cast a big black moving shadow on the trail. It didn't help. In fact, it made me hesitate with each step because I keep thinking there was something lurking just before me. Again, I'm just trying to get through until the sun comes up and levels the playing field. I get to the turn and quickly make the bend. I'm moving pretty fast at this point, trying to be quiet still, taking tiny shallow breaths so I can listen while humping it up the trail. It is a delicate thing to try to carry a substantial amount of hiking gear while trying to not make any sounds. For a lot of people, it's impossible, but it can be done. When you find yourself out there enough, some situations demand it. That's when I smell it. I stop in my tracks and take it in. A stench hits me that I cannot describe. I just imagine wet, rotten death. I've actually worked scenes where humans have expired in a past life as a firefighter. This was like days of old decomposition, but it just smelled strange, unplaceable. And being so far removed from civilization, it really limited the options. 
There wasn't even trash or sewage out here. There wasn't a burn pit. I kept walking fast. By the time I made it to the top of that ridge, I was huffing, and the first light was showing. I didn't stop moving until full light was out and the birds were now chirping. Once the sun was up, I no longer cared about being quiet. Whatever was out there could see me the whole time. It chose to leave me alone. I've heard it all in the woods, I've smelled it all, and I'm telling you, I don't know what the hell that was. Deadfall, and especially leafed out branches, make a lot of noise on the way down. I've heard it many, many times. I don't know. I kept on. I finished my hike that day. Never encountered anything that forced me to turn around. It's just a weird time in a weird place when I heard that weird noise. And to this day, nothing like that has ever happened in that area again. I was somewhere in the middle of the White Mountains in the summer when I walked into what looked like a scene from a horror movie. I was alone, roughly eight miles from the nearest recreational area. I liked to hike off trail and see the sights, discover little ponds and stuff like that. On this day, I discovered a campsite where something very, very bad had taken place. A person with zero hiking, camping, or any other experience had gotten themselves into trouble, big trouble. It was around 7 a.m. when I found the campsite. The place is absolutely annihilated, like a tornado touchdown, picked up the whole place and then slammed it back down. Trash everywhere, clothes shredded to ribbons, the tent chewed to strips of polyester. It smelled like death and septic, like rotten human waste throughout the whole area. The first thing that hit me was the eerie stillness until I noticed the desperate looking human figure covered in blood whimpering quietly under a tree by the tent. They were riddled with open wounds of varying severity. I could see flesh and meat hanging out of some of the deeper lacerations. They weren't festering, but they weren't pouring blood either. Whatever happened had taken place a while ago. The person had gone to the bathroom all over themselves. The smell in the air was starting to come together. This person had been lying there for a long time. I put my bag down grabbed my kit and went over to the person. They looked like they just lost a knife fight with a four-armed man. Deep slashes from one shoulder to hip, single punctures up and down his back, and his hands and forearms full of what looked like to be defensive cuts. I patched him up the best I could, gave him water, checked my map and hightailed it to the closest road. This was well before cell phones were super prevalent and barely worked inside those mountains. Thankfully, there was a road very close by, kinda, less than two miles, but when you're walking through the brush, it isn't exactly speedy. I busted through as quick as I could while trying to piece it all together. I wish I'd examined the campsite a little better. Was he out there alone? Did he have a disagreement with someone while he was camping and it turned fatal? Did some stranger do this? I didn't know what to think. Animals are always a possibility, but why didn't they finish the job? I got to the road and didn't know which way to go. There wasn't any community to walk to, simply looking for other people to get help. I started going north and fortunately, I was able to flag someone down, a couple of guys bumping around in an old jeep. I explained what I came upon as best I could and I must have done a good job because their faces lost more and more color the longer I talked. They agreed to help and took off down the road. They said they'd get authorities and lead them back to this exact spot that I met them on the road. It was the quickest way to meet back up again. The whole rescue operation was like a baton race because everyone had the location of the next person, but no one single person actually knew the entire route. The guys in the Jeep knew how to get to town, and they would know how to get back to me, and I would lead them to the bloodbath. There was only one thing to do. I waited for assistance to arrive. It took them about an hour until they came rumbling up the mountain, and I led them to the still unidentified individual. He was not very conversant when I helped him out. I was actually pretty sure he'd be dead before we arrived. I mean, sitting there for an hour, it's not hard to arrive at some grim conclusions. That guy was clearly close to death. Even if we got there in time, infection could take him out at any point after retrieval. It took another hour to get the emergency responders back into the canyon. 
I assisted them in bringing him out. Once we got him on the stretcher, I could see his wounds were far worse than I'd realized. Every inch of him was crushed and sliced up in every direction. Fat and muscle hung out of him and off the stretcher during those steep declines. The guy was in and out of consciousness the whole time, and rightfully so. I couldn't imagine the pain this guy endured for days on end. We huffed him up the last ridge, loaded him into the response vehicle. The sheriff and forest rangers asked if I wanted to lift back, and so I took them up on their offer, headed back into town, and got myself cleaned up. The whole day turned into be much more than just a distance hike, but a life or death mission for a stranger we all didn't know. After cleaning up and getting myself situated at their station, I went on my way, leaving them my number to call me and let me know what was up with the person that we helped out. A buddy of mine came and picked me up, then gave me a lift out to the trailhead where I'd left my truck. I told him the details as we drove, shaking the entire drive. We made it. I collected my rig and made the trip back home. I got home from work three days later. There was a message on my machine. It was the sheriff's department. The story was, the guy I found decided to go camping one day and heard that he had to keep his food hung from a tree to keep bears away. Well, he did that, but he put it almost directly over his tent, and not high enough. The night before I happened upon that site, a bear had used the tent and its occupant in an attempt to climb the tree to get the food. The guy had woken up to four black bear paws sinking into his body, shifting to reach up. Dude survived and swore to the hospital staff that he was moving to the city and never going into the woods ever again. This happened to me and some friends of mine in Sydney, Australia. When we wanted to go underage drinking, we would buy a case of beer or a bottle of spirit and hike about four kilometers into the bush, to the middle of nowhere, to drink without worrying about getting in trouble. We would pass out in a sleeping bag under the stars in the summer and be just fine. This is the quintessential Outback shenanigans, dirt dwelling with a bottle of alcohol and your best asshole friends around you. At the end of the day though, it's harmless. We aren't trying to get up into any trouble, cause damage, or even bother anybody. It's a rite of passage, how we grow up into who we're supposed to be. I'm sure your country and culture has a similar pastime for the youth. What happened to us though, is a bit more out of the ordinary. So one afternoon, my friends decide it's a camping night and head off with beer to the usual spot we'd use. We all just collectively agreed, packed, and then piled into the youths for the journey. It was impromptu, really no planning, and that means none of us checked the weather. This was a big no-no, as we really knew better, and had gotten into hairy situations before because of storms and the like. And of course, the forecast was for dangerous storms up and down that entire area. The forecast was for later in the evening, so as we drove, there wasn't a cloud in sight. Getting rained out wasn't on our radar even the slightest and the delayed thunderheads was a perfect lure for us. So we get out there, set up a meager camp, and let the party rage into the evening. Some of us are dancing, some of us are talking, but all of us are hammered. It's what we came here to do, and honestly, we're really good at it. Too good. None of us noticed the buildup above us, and a slight rumbling in the distance. We did a final round of shots and passed out before we even caught a warning. As I explained, the camping we did was extremely rough. We had a little fire pit, the sleeping bags, and maybe a couple of chairs and a portable speaker, and absolutely no coverage. No trees, no tarps, no canvas, no tent. There's nothing to use as a shelter. This is bush camping, and the only place we could cut loose and catch a buzz. In the middle of the night, all five of us drunk teenagers left the campsite to shelter in caves nearby. The rain woke us up first torrential as it poured out of the sky and into our sleeping bags. The panic was overwhelming, and soon the lightning and thunder had us all worked up and frothing at the mouth. It's scary to be caught out in extreme unexpected weather. There's literally nowhere to go. I don't know why, but it reminded me of drowning or something, just being totally out of control of the situation, breathless and trying to escape. 
The caves sit up high, overlooking a large fork in the Hawkesbury River. We had a rough idea of where they were, but the storm had us completely disoriented. A lightning flash would illuminate the ridgeline and have us all shuffling. Another flash, and we'd look up to see how somehow we ran in the wrong direction. It was like a f***ed up game of cat and mouse, except this game felt fatal. We made it though, despite the whole planet working against us. The dirt turned to mud beneath us, sucking off our shoes and socks. The rocks gave way at every turn and let us fall on our asses. We didn't care. We scrambled up the face of the hill and found our way into the mouth of the system. We laid there in a pile for a while, catching our breath. We'd all flinch every time the lightning flashed or thunder barked. Soaked from the rain and cold, we eventually started to laugh, harder than we ever have. All of it was terrifying just a few seconds ago, and now it didn't matter. We were still pretty drunk, it turned out. A couple of us set to digging a fire pit. We had a couple of lighters amongst us, and there was random scrub brush along the cave floor. We took turns scraping the dry, cracked earth with stones and fingertips, careful not to fold them back on the rogue rocks in the soil. We got maybe five inches down when we discovered something, something more than bones. Human remains, fresh enough to recognize as body parts, hair, skin, the whole thing. Now we are really stuck and we can't leave the cave because of the aggression of the storm outside and we're trapped with a dead body in a shallow grave. Half of us cracked up right there and started crying, speechless at the sight. Did someone really dump a body out here? Is there some kind of predator deeper within this cave, sleeping off its last meal? We huddled together and tried to be quiet, but it was a rapidly devolving situation. All we wanted was for dawn to break. Then we could evaluate what was going on a bit better, come up with some sort of plan. We sat by the mouth of the cave as to not be so close to the corpse that shared the cave with us. The storm broke long before the sun came up. We broke for home in a second, running at full sprint right past our camp into the bush and back into our neighborhood. It took us an hour to make the trip, stumbling, bruising our shins and cutting our feet open. We told our parents what happened, who promptly called the police. They conducted an investigation in the morning and discovered those remains. They belonged to an aboriginal burial site and were apparently still in use by various outlying villages. We didn't realize just how far outside of town we were out there, and we never went back there after, especially after we spent the night with the dead. I was walking a section of the Appalachian Trail with a couple of buddies when we happened across a bundle of sticks. The sticks were made into a figure, kind of similar to the ones from the Blair Witch Project. It was obviously placed there by someone, as it was dead center in the middle of the trail, leaning up against a rock. I thought it was cool, so I grabbed it and put it inside my backpack. Lots of people leave weird stuff on hiking trails, particularly in the Appalachian. Everyone knows another hiker is just a week, a day, an hour, or even just 10 minutes behind you. Not everyone likes it, but some of us leave little trinkets and gifts for whoever is following in our footsteps. Sometimes it's food or beer, other times it's a blanket or a handcrafted item, like that stick bundle. The figure was cool, and I didn't think twice about grabbing it. The work that it took to intertwine everything was incredibly intricate. I wanted to try to replicate it later on, on a day when I had more time to kill. It was beautiful and eye-catching. The other guys thought it was weird. Like I said, it was reminiscent of the Blair Witch, but the movie was a couple years old at this point, and the novelty of it being supposedly true had definitely worn off. Anyway, we finished the hike and set up for the night in our camping spot. We were all pretty wiped out from the long day, so after dinner, we retired to our respective tents and conked out for the night. These were distant days where we were trying to get the miles behind us. The next morning, I was the first one awake, so I got up to make the coffee. And what did I find? An identical bundle of sticks to the one that we'd found, sitting atop the pile of charred wood from the previous night's fire. And when I say identical, I mean uncanny. Titter tat, it was the exact same handiwork, the twists, the knots, all the same. 
First thing I did was check my pack, and sure enough, the one that I'd picked up was still there. Each of my friends swore they didn't put it there, and I obviously said the same. It was weird, because we were all adamant about not putting it there, but I could never be sure that one of them wasn't messing with the other one of us. The thing that messes with me is the bundle that I found in the morning was almost an exact replica of the one that we found on the trail earlier. I find it hard to believe that not one of the other guys could have made such a close replica without being able to model it after the one in my pack. And it's not like either would have placed the one on the trail beforehand for us to stumble upon, as it was far in the middle of nowhere. It also would have been hard for anyone to just find us. We didn't camp along the trail, wary of passing hikers and strangers. All kinds of undesirables hike and loiter along the Appalachian Trail, the low-key hot spot for some of the weirdest people you could ever meet. It's not like it's every other person or something, but when you encounter an odd person out there, you just know it almost immediately. We camped isolated, almost hidden, for this exact reason. I want to believe one of them pulled a prank on the other, because the alternative scares the shit out of me. I was hiking across Newfoundland, following an old railway that was long ago disassembled and turned into a giant trail, sleeping wherever I found myself at night. This wasn't really recreational at the time. I was in and out of drug use, homelessness, and general living on the fringes of society. Being in town or even near people was a point of stress for me. When I wanted to use drugs, I preferred to be alone with no chance of any kind of interaction. It dissolved any guilt or wrongdoing that I felt, and allowed me to really lean into the highs and lows that I wanted to feel. So this particular hike was a drug using tour. I carried a small pack of items that would keep me on the road. Extra clothes, some water, pocket knife, lighter, real basic supplies. I kept a tarp and a rope to fix a shelter. At this point, town and any sign of people is a good two days behind me. I followed the rusted railway deep through the wilderness until I could no longer recognize any geography. I'd get high and just keep walking and exploring until I wanted to get high again. One day I ran into a small cottage town, except everything was abandoned. Trailers falling apart, bus conversions burn out, small cabins all shuttered up. It was creepy but interesting at the same time. The urban decay was like nothing I'd ever seen, especially being so rural. Who used to live here and why did they have to leave? I felt like I discovered a forgotten mystery. The sun was waning, so I decided to set up camp in a mostly empty lot that had an abandoned truck slowly falling into a ravine that was near it. The ravine itself was full of all kinds of random debris, appliances, bags of clothes, scrap metal. Everything was eerie and just out of place. You add my drug-addled brain to the mix and I really couldn't make sense of any of it. I pondered the place while I cooked up some food and then crawled into my sleeping bag. I wake up sometime in the night. I hear footsteps outside my camp. At first, I just think it's an animal, but the steps sound like someone walking, a human. The openness of my tarp set up really let me hear every footfall as it happened. The steps got closer and go around my position. I slowly and quietly pull out my knife. He tries to get me. My plan is to stab first and ask questions later. Anyone trying to get into my camp in the middle of nowhere is looking to do some kind of harm. My heart is racing at this point, but I'm trying to stay quiet. There's no phone, nowhere to run, no other options of any kind. Either he's going to walk away or one of us is going to die out here. The footsteps stop somewhere outside of camp. I assume he came up quicker on me than expected saw the outline of my belongings in the trees. For a split second, we can hear each other breathing. That's it, like every other backpacker's worst fear. For me, it's doubled. It's a crazed killer, some forest weirdo. Or is it the police, coming to investigate a squatter near an abandoned village? I had it in my head. They'd find all my drugs and paraphernalia, lock me up before sunrise. I honestly don't know which outcome was worse. Luckily, the steps start moving away from the tarp until I can no longer hear them. I wait a bit to see if they come back, but I don't hear anything. I slowly get out of my tarp. 
still don't see anything. Without turning on my flashlight, I quickly take down everything, stuff it inside my bag. After that, I just started walking down the trails to get the hell out of there. I walked until daytime. I came across a road and flagged down a truck. That guy was nice, drove me to town where I got a hotel. The creepy thing, when I think back to it, was that whoever was likely watching me walked into town from one of those abandoned structures. I'm guessing a squatter. I'd like to think that he was just curious, but I'm glad I didn't stay and wait to see if he'd be back. This definitely falls into the strangest category. While solo pitching for a long weekend in the Pacific Northwest, the one day was in the rare part of the trail that is closer to civilization. So there was a higher chance of other hikers and campers being around. I saw one or two people, but that was mostly from afar. It was nightfall soon, getting cold, and I was getting deeper into the woods. I knew the odds of seeing someone else was highly unlikely. I was hiking around the small pond and was going to set up camp nearby when I heard this shuffling noise behind a small rock wall type of thing. It was like an outcrop of boulders that laid in a fault line. It was a repetitive noise. It got louder and then quieter, but never stopped at all. Basically, if you're a regular hiker, you know a noise that does not fit in the woods when you hear it. I took out my two knives that I carry when hiking and slowly walked around the boulder, honestly not knowing what I'd see. This is part of the deal out there though. It's why I carry blades with me through the brush. There are animals, weirdos, and any number of unknown factors that might come at you. You gotta be prepared for anything, and being prepped sometimes mean taking it head on. What I did not expect, and was very shocked to see, was a very attractive couple in their 20s, having very aggressive but happy doggy style sex on a blanket. Obviously, they were as shocked as I was to see one another. They freaked and yelled, as did I, and as they covered their bodies and their clothes in a panic, I awkwardly apologized, picked up all my gear, and then just sort of jogged off into the woods, passing their tent that they pitched along the way. I completely missed their equipment. It was erected on the other side of the slope of the hill, the one I hadn't come up on. They were at ease being so far into the wilderness, but they didn't account for me to go bushwhacking in their same tracks. I backtracked for about a half a mile before I figured I was in the clear. It's not like they were going to chase me down. I bet I looked like a real psycho coming around that boulder, wide-eyed and wielding a pair of daggers. I reset my campsite and laughed myself to sleep that night. I wonder if that couple is still together, and if they tell that story when they get drunk at parties, like sometimes I do. I was camping in Northern California, like at the very tippy top of California, deep in the woods at a reservoir. This place could be big for recreation in the right time of year, but this was fall and during the middle of the week, so I found myself completely alone out there. I had my truck back there off the road a good four or five miles. I had to go poop really bad in the morning before the sun was up, and there's no bathrooms. So I walked down the trail and found this little spot, isolated away from the trail next to this blackberry bush and an outcropping of water from the reservoir. As I stated, there was no other camps around, no cars. I can't even hear an engine revving in the area. I'm alone as alone can be. I heard some crashing in the tree line as it just started to become light outside. The hell just stumbled into my secret area. I realized I don't know if it's hunting season in this area. I'm hidden in the brush. I'd heard a lot of people accidentally shot deep in the wilderness areas during the hunting seasons. I peeked over the blackberry bush, and not 40 feet from me, a huge bear, easily 500 pounds. I tried to sneak away, but as I was stepping backwards, I kid you not, I stepped onto a twig that snapped. My pants are halfway down my legs, my rear end is a mess, and now I'm on the radar of an apex predator. Sneaking isn't an option, and running is a death sentence. This bear and I instantly both turn our heads towards one another, lock eyes. We both know what's going on. I'm scared and the bear isn't. The bear is curious, 
hungry, maybe agitated. The way it crashed into the clearing, it sounded like it. Me? I'm half naked, covered in sweat. I hear it huff on the other side of the bush. It's deciding how to go about securing breakfast. I attempted to make myself look big and make noise. Bear didn't budge. In fact, he started to walk towards me now. This wasn't good because it was the only option I was comfortable with. Everyone has heard that you just make yourself big and loud. They go away. Nope. They don't go away. They come and see what you're made of. Many things were racing through my mind. The number one being, there's no way I'm curling up into a ball and allowing this monstrously giant bear to mess with me. I crouched down as low as I could behind the blackberry bush so he couldn't see me. I start running as fast as I could while crouched and squatting down. This was it, the last avenue. Scaring it didn't work, so flight was the last choice. You have to remember that I was alone out there, the only camper around the reservoir. Even if I screamed, no one would be coming to bail me out. My thought process was that if he couldn't see me run, maybe he wouldn't chase me if I was already kind of far away before he actually saw me running over that blackberry bush. It worked. He pursued around the bush for maybe 20 feet, decided it wasn't worth it, and allowed my escape. The bear had gotten so close that I could actually smell him, could see the slobber dripping from its mouth. Honestly, I thought I was going to be breakfast for this bear, and that would be the end of me. I got back to camp, cleaned up, and waited for my visitor to come barreling out of the trees. He never did, and I stayed on high alert for the rest of that trip. Me and a group of 20 others were hiking in a two-person line, hip to hip with a partner. We were walking through very thick woods at around 1 a.m. Certain members were designated to carry a flashlight. Others on each end of the line carried radios for quick contact. This was a training exercise for a wilderness survival program. So we were in good spirits, with a high energy despite the late hour. Our young team was very prepared to complete the overnight training. We managed to find a muddy road which we continued to walk over for miles before going back into the woods. We practiced direction changes, quick marches, silent stalking, team stops, and terrain sprints. While walking on that muddy road again, I held a conversation with one of my friends that was right in front of me. We were no longer marching in ordered pairs, more of a free walk as we navigated the woods. After a while of talking, I noticed that my group was further ahead of me than they were before so I picked up the pace. I must have gotten distracted and slowly fallen behind with my buddy. As I got closer, I noticed something odd. The friend that I was talking to was already with the rest of my group. I turned back and saw that I was alone. No sign of my friend or anyone along the road. Who the hell was I talking to? I looked back again to make sure the radio man wasn't slinking behind too, and perhaps I was overhearing a conversation, mistaking it for my own. No radio man, nothing. I went to my friend and asked him how to get back so quickly. He turned and looked at me and said, I was wondering where you were, you disappeared for a good five minutes. Let's just say I didn't feel alright after hearing those words. I know for a fact that I was speaking to him earlier, and if not him, then someone exactly the same with all the same gear. Luckily nothing happened after that, but I was pretty shook for the rest of that hiking night. This all happened in Poland when I was a teenager many, many years ago. There's no phones or any kind of social media back then. I've wondered about that experience ever since it happened. I've never had it happen yet, but I always worry about stumbling across a pot grow. I found abandoned ones, never an active one, thankfully. I live in the southwest, where this isn't really a far-fetched notion. People find these things all the time, at least they did 10 years ago. Cartel affiliates, and even just regular outlaw citizens, go deep in the wilderness and set up a perimeter, then proceed to fill the acreage with row after row of pot growth. They aren't necessarily bad people, but this was a felony, and so required the security of such. It wasn't uncommon to be chased out of these grow operations by heavily armed gunmen. All of these stories conjured a paranoia for me, 
as my hobby took me deep into the reaches of the wilderness. I'd often be alone, only lightly armed with zero contact to the outside world. One time, I found a completely empty gallon milk jug, sitting on a rock in the middle of a creek, an inch above the waterline, with some water splashed on the surrounding rocks like somebody had just walked into the middle of the creek. The rocks were in a shallow spot, but there were two deep pools on either side, so they would have been in the water, at least up to their hips, to get away from the creek. I just stood there and kind of took in the details for a while. The hell did I just walk upon? I was miles from any kind of trailhead or camping area, rough and tumble hiking into a pretty isolated canyon. It wasn't the strangest thing for somebody to come upon, but for them to take off, the second they hear me, I just didn't get it. They'd have to be up to something to run, right? It was really creepy because there was no sign of anyone around. The creek had flooded the night before. That little empty jug would have been beat to hell and placed either much higher along the creek or absolutely buried in the floating refuse. The jug was clean, intact, unscuffed, and essentially brand new. It even had an expiration date that hadn't yet come to pass. Someone had just set this jug down when I came around the bend. There's no tracks on the bank, and it would have been close to impossible for anyone else to have been in that narrow canyon without me being aware of them. I'd have seen their tracks or even seen them. No explanation for it other than somebody had heard me coming and scampered down the middle of the creek to avoid leaving tracks before climbing out somewhere where the bank was rocky and then hiding from me after that. As for why, who knows? Mental illness or criminal activity? I did leave that area in a hurry though. In that same area years later on, on another trip, somebody lit my campsite up from directly above with a high powered spotlight in the middle of the night. It was like nothing I've ever experienced. Complete illumination, silent, totally disarming. You don't know vulnerability until some unseen force above you lights up your entire world just to take a look at you. There is nobody around, no aircraft overhead. No trees big enough to hide a person. Nothing. Absolute dead silence. I would have heard branches crackling if there was anybody in the trees above me or anywhere around me. The light didn't come from the branches, though. It came from well above them. Only later did someone suggest to me that it might have been grow op related. Maybe the growers upgraded their security to include drones, which would be a genius move on their part. It would also make sense for the government agencies to employ drones while searching for these grow ops. It was a military buddy of mine who suggested the theory to me. He explained that he'd seen drones due to terrorists exactly what had happened to me. Just to light up their camps, make them freeze while fire teams moved into position. I've mistaken elk for bears in the middle of the night a few times. Never had a bear in my camp, but I've had more elk than a few times. It's always good for some heart racing panic until you get a positive ID on the large critter bumping around camp. It definitely still doesn't even compare to what it felt like when that light hit me. I didn't know where to post this, but I guess this is a good place as any. I've been a long lurker of the horror community and finally decided to share one of my stories that I've tried to block out of my mind. I have posted pictures that I took during that day. And before you ask, no, I do not have the camera or the drive that the pictures were on. I tried looking through the metadata of the pictures and videos that I captured, but the time frame that we hiked and the timestamp on the images are way off. With that being said, I'm almost certain that I have a picture that was taken right at the time of the event. But again, I don't know which one it is. Now on to my story. The following took place on July 19th, 2011. I'll give you a little background. Every summer since I was seven, I would go out to California to visit my dad. He would take me up and down the state, visiting all the cool places a kid wanted to go to. As I got older, he started to take me to national parks like Yellowstone, Redwoods, and Yosemite. During this year in particular, he wanted to go back to Yosemite and rent one of those tents you see in a village campsite. I was really excited since the last time we were there. We stayed in a hotel that was nearly two hours outside of the park. He also mentioned we should hit the park's infamous mist trail that goes up 
Vernal Falls again since. Well, last time, I had difficulty hiking up it, since my feet were killing me. He even hinted that he wanted to go down the John Muir Trail that was on top of the falls. Now John Muir, for those of you that don't know, he's a bit of a California legend. He sought out to preserve some of the wilderness lands in the United States. His most notable accomplishment was establishing Yosemite as a national park in 1890. But even after his death, the man had a hospital and a middle school named after him. The last bit of information that I want to point out here was during that year, Yosemite set a record of its waterfalls being three times more powerful than ever before due to the amount of snow and rain it had received during the winter and springtime. I think it was even featured on the nightly news when Brian Williams was on there at the time. On the morning of the hike, both my dad and I woke up with excitement. The two of us had trained for this day, and me being on the cross-country team for my school and him working out at the gym, we were more than ready to take on this amazing trail. We packed up our backpacks, put on our boots, and drove my dad's SUV to the trailhead parking spot. When we got there, it was around 8.30, and the parking lot was already full. I guess there were a lot of people eager to see this once-in-a-lifetime moment. We had to park all the way over where the Curry Village was. This will be important for later. After a mile and a half, we reached the trailhead. The first part of the mist trail is paved, and it has some steep hill inclines, nothing too extreme. After you reach the end of the paved trail, you go across a footbridge over the stream that's at the bottom of the falls. However, that little stream is full-blown Rapid River. Now keep in mind, the park at the time had a very limited amount of signs and guardrails around the water areas, so it wasn't uncommon to see people wander off the trail just to be by the stream to sunbathe or dip their feet in. Kids would also want to go in and splash each other like they were at a water park. My dad and I were also guilty of going off the trails to take pictures and such. Some of my pictures that I provided for you guys shows just how easy it was to be by the water. As for the park rangers, some of them really didn't mind it at the time. In fact, it was kind of nice having people explore the park, just as long as they were cautious and used good judgment. I haven't been back to Yosemite since this event. I don't know how strict they are with this trail. I also forgot to mention this earlier, but the trail isn't for everybody. Once you pass the footbridge, it's all uphill, and you have to climb up these stone steps. Some of the steps have eroded or washed away over the years, which made it extra difficult to climb in certain areas, especially when it got to be really narrow. You also have to combat the mist from the falls and not lose your footing, otherwise you might fall over the edge and into the water. After a short break, my dad and I started to head up Vernal Falls, and like I mentioned earlier, the mist from the falls was very intense, but it was rewarding in a way. When we got to the top, it was almost noon, and we were ready to tear open our lunches, but before we did that, we went over to the John Muir Trailhead while taking some along the way. The trail wasn't too long, but if we wanted to get back to the parking lot, we would have to take another trail which took way longer than the mist trail. We came to a conclusion that we would think about it during lunch since our hunger was just now overwhelming. That's when my dad asked me if we should eat by the falls or find a quieter place. To this day, I still don't know what made me blurt out that we should find a quieter spot away from the falls and other noisy tourists. My dad agreed. We made our way up to the river to the point that it becomes a small creek and then sat down at a picnic area. There was no one in sight. All that we could hear was the water flowing in the streams and the birds chirping. As we were finishing up, we saw a bunch of people coming from every direction and they weren't walking or running. It was as if they were in a rush to get somewhere, but didn't know where to go. We didn't think anything of it, decided to head over to the stream before we went back to the falls. Now to get to the stream, you had to walk over a bunch of rocks that were fun to climb and jump over. We approached one, jumped over the gap, my dad went first making it look easy, while I, on the other hand, had to get a running head start. As I made my way over the gap, I heard something hiss and sort of jump up in my leg. Upon landing, I quickly turned around to see a coiled up rattlesnake in the gap with his eyes fixed on me. Luckily for me, he didn't bite me, I was a safe distance away. I called out for my dad, who was like Indiana Jones when it comes to snakes. I pointed it out, and when he saw it, his face turned pale white. 
I laughed as he backed away in fear. And as he did that, another hiker was making their way right for the gap. I immediately told him to go around, and he had a confused expression on his face. Then once he came around to our side, he saw that rattlesnake. He took out his phone to take pictures and videos. At this point, my dad had definitely had enough of that snake and made his way to the stream, which I followed him, hoping that guy wouldn't get bit. The creek was pretty shallow and was hard to believe that it turned into this roaring waterfall. I stayed at the edge of the creek to soak my bandana in the cold while my dad went a little further and bent down to do the same. Then all of a sudden, this guy came out of nowhere and started talking to my dad in a frantic voice. He said something along the lines of, Sir, you're not allowed to be in there. Please get out of the water. Like I mentioned earlier, it wasn't uncommon to see people by the water, especially near a small stream like this one. It was very odd though, because this guy wasn't a park ranger, nor was he dressed for hiking. My dad slowly got up and said to the guy, uh, We're just soaking our sweatbands before we head back down. Everything is fine. The man grew more concerned. Sir, please, you need to get out of the water now. It's very dangerous. I just saw three people die from where you're standing. Then the man turned to me and said, Son, if you value your father's life, you have to get him out of there. I'm completely speechless at this point. My dad is ignoring this man's pleas, but before either one of us could say or do anything, the man runs off trying to warn other tourists that were getting close to the water. After he was out of sight, my dad got out and we grabbed our backpacks and headed towards the falls. As we were walking, I asked my dad what that guy meant when he said that he saw three people die just where we were standing in that small stream. He looked at me confused as well, but reassured me that maybe they fell and hurt themselves or something. That confused me even more. The stream wasn't as powerful as the fall, so how could someone lose their footing and die? The thought didn't last long because that was then distracted by the crowd of people that were gathering around the area where I'd spotted that rattlesnake. We were trying to find a park ranger so that no one would get hurt, but for some reason, there wasn't one in sight. We kept walking till we finally made it to the falls, and at that point, we were completely exhausted from that hike up. So we decided to go back down the mist trail. When we got to the trailhead, there was a large crowd of people blocking the trail. Impatiently, we made our way through the group of people and confused hikers. And that's when we saw the caution tape all along the trail itself. There must have been 15 park rangers scouting the area, telling hikers coming up off the trail to turn back immediately. Someone asked one of the rangers why they were closing it off, and almost in a calm and professional tone, the ranger said this. Oh, everything is alright, there's just a dead animal that was found on the trail, and the smell is really unbearable. We're trying to remove it, but for now... The mist trail is closed. Everyone here will have to take the John Muir trail to get back down. I immediately knew something was off. There was way too much caution tape for just one dead animal, and why were they taping off the edges that are near the falls? Also, the two park rangers that were on the trail weren't looking on the trail itself. They were looking down into the water. Then I heard on the static of one of their radios. All I could make out was something about missing hikers. The John Muir Trail turned out to be a pretty nice detour. That is, until we hit the Paranorma Trail. It was caked with horse droppings and the smell was as bad as you can imagine. It went on for 10 miles. We caught up with some of the other hikers along the way. We're all speculating on what actually happened. One said that it was a bear that died. The rangers had to get a dump truck to haul it away. Another said it was a moose or a deer. It's funny what people come up with in these types of situations, but all of them. Would end up being wrong. Two hours later, we all finally get to the bottom of the trail, and my legs feel like jelly at this point. We still needed to get back to the parking lot. On the way back there, we spotted another park ranger standing guard at the mist trailhead. Curiosity got the better of my dad. He went over to the ranger and asked what actually happened. The ranger, knowing that my dad wasn't buying the whole dead animal story, let out a sigh and with a hesitant expression on his face, he said, There's these three hikers. They were part of this church group. They all decided to go over the railings that were near the top of the falls to take some pictures. The first victim went in the water, eventually lost their footing and fell. It was only a matter of time for the current to take him down the waterfall. And two more hikers from that group went in and tried to save him. They also lost their footing 
and was overtaken by the current. It was at this point, people who were all witnessing this discouraged others from jumping in unless they wanted to have the same thing happen to them. The drop didn't kill them instantly and the rocks below would have torn them apart. The trail was closed shortly after in fear of one of their bodies being on it. I sat there mortified. If we had decided to eat our lunch over there, we would have been one of the many dozens of people that witnessed this horrible event. Do nothing but stand there and watch as three people fell to their fate. What that ranger told us still haunts me to this day. Due to the falls and rapids being this powerful, we cannot recover the bodies until it dies down in October or even November. My heart sunk into my chest, thinking about the friends and family members of the victims. It's going to be a while for them to be there until recovery. We got back into our car with our legs aching from that 12 mile hike and for the rest of the way back, it was completely silent. I never brought it up to my dad again and I still think about that man telling my dad to get out. I don't know what I would have done if my dad was one of those victims. It just goes to show you that no picture is worth risking your own life. I'll link some articles of this event. You can also do some research of your own. In one of the articles I've listed, it's a follow up on the bodies being recovered. I'll summarize it here in case you don't want to read it. David Hormiz, 22 years old, was the first to be discovered a month after the incident. He was pinned against a boulder 250 feet downstream. Ninos Yaku, age 27, was found on November 29th, trapped under towering boulders that weren't visible until the river level was at its lowest. Then the following Saturday, Ramina Badel, 21 years old, was found. The three were from the close-knit community of Central Valley Christians from the Middle East. My heart goes out to the friends and families of those victims. May they rest in peace. Thank you for reading my post. I live in Alaska. That probably puts a pretty clear image in your head of what I deal with inside the wilderness. It's a long list, but many of the dangers are things unlikely to be encountered. But some of them are just a given. Wolves, sometimes. But it's the bears we all really look out for. A lot of the predators out there are smarter than we give them credit for. But bears don't give a shit. They want to push the boundaries, test the limits, and sometimes, even just piss you off. It's like dealing with a dog that can take your head clean off. I was stalked by a bear for a couple of miles while hunting deer. It was mid-September. It was probably 40 degrees. This is important too because bears can operate better at different temperatures. Too hot and they become lazy. Too cold and things become too much work for them. They don't want to be put in the chase. That Goldilocks zone between 30 and 60 degrees. And that bear might tail you for two or three miles just to see if you make a mistake. It's a truly haunting experience. The weather wasn't extreme, but that's one of the scariest things that's ever happened to me that I can at least recall out there. I'd recently watched Revenant with Leonardo DiCaprio. I was with my son, so I was a little on edge already. And then this bear comes out of nowhere. The Revenant aside, we've all heard of the infamous Grizzly Man. Tim Treadwell was a bear enthusiast, known for his seasonal treks into the Alaskan bush, wherein he would live alongside groups of grizzlies. He was mercilessly eaten alive over the course of an hour or two in the fall of 2003, something many of the outdoorsmen whisper about around a campfire up here. It's a worse fear for a lot of us, truly a fate worse than death. We were walking down a game trail, and the brush was so thick, and the bear was barely 20 feet in front of us, and you couldn't even see it, but you could hear it and smell it. This is a signature for the area up here. You can almost always tell there's a bear near you before even seeing it. The smell is a huge indicator, but also the stillness. A forest will just go dead silent, as will a stream, a glen, or really anything. It's an energy nothing trifles with. I'm walking up the trail. Everything in front of us was shaking. Then all of a sudden, everything stopped. The only thing that I could hear was the bear breathing 
and the sound of my own heartbeat. I handed my son the 44 mag and loaded around into my rifle. I told him to run if we were attacked. We started to back up slowly and it took a step. Because of deep-rooted fear of bear encounters, many outdoorsmen up here carry a heavy sidearm. The rifle itself is good, but it's only one big bullet before you have to rechamber a shell with the bolt. Having a semi-automatic pistol enables you to squeeze the trigger six, seven, maybe even ten times, depending on the caliber. It's also quicker barrel correction for moving targets. It's also a quicker draw. It just makes sense for danger encounters where the hunter no longer has the upper hand. Leo DiCaprio in The Revenant would have been just fine had he carried a 10mm over that muzzle-loading musket. Such is life. I started to yell at it, and it stopped dead in its tracks, which surprised and relieved us both. We both heard stories. You're supposed to yell and try to scare them off. But there's lots of stories where that stuff doesn't flat out work. When I saw it hesitate, I wasted no time. We stepped off the game trail and started bushwhacking down the hill. It began to follow us, and when I started to hear it getting closer, I would turn around and yell. It was better than dumping a couple of rounds in this thing for it to scuffle off, and then have to deal with the wounds somewhere else. Call me stupid, but I respect wildlife. I'm not trying to kill or maim anything I can't get home and eat myself. It followed us for like maybe two miles. It was never more than 50 or 60 feet behind us. Just trudging along, investigating. Only once did I swing around and put a bead on it with my rifle. That breathing got aggressive for a second, and it sounded like it was thrashing toward us. We made eye contact for a brief second through the gap of my sights, and it took careful steps back into the foliage. It was a scary experience, but having my son with me opened up a whole new world of fear. All I could think about was one of us having to watch the other get eaten completely incapacitated from the fight. But fortunately, for both of us, it got bored and thankfully left us alone. This story ended up being a lot longer than I originally anticipated and I apologize for the long read. I will say that in all the years I've told this story, people usually respond like this. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. So I hope you take the time to enjoy it. This story occurred in the summer of 2008. I grew up in Oregon, was acquainted with the outdoors at an early age. My favorite hobby came to be hunting, particularly in areas that are either very dangerous or isolated. The health benefits of hunting were secondary to the thrills of walking to the edges of exposed cliffs, being in cougar and bear territory, and knowing that I was far from help. Into the Wild was released in the fall of 2007, and I immediately fell in love. Being a high school senior, I could barely go another week of living in my parents' house. The movie spoke to my sense of adventure, and inspired me to hike the California portion of the Pacific Crest Trail, right after graduation. I made it from the Mexico border to Northern California without much incident. I saw rattlesnakes and black bears, experienced dehydration, but nothing happened that made me fear for my life. I was stalking quail and grouse, two of my favorite birds to hunt. Also, two of the easiest to get a permit for in a state that you don't live in. Bird hunting satisfied me in the sense that you get to get all the good stuff. Hiking, tracking, spotting, stalking but you don't have to deal with the dead weight at the end. Everything you clip weighs under a pound, so it's easy to bring 10 or 15 home to clean. It also limits what you need to carry in terms of a firearm. For birds, all you really need is a single shot 20 gauge, which is exactly what I was using. It's a small caliber, but it's still a shotgun, enough to leave someone feeling at least a little protected. Somewhere in the National Forest in Northeastern California, I walked around a bend in the trail only to be startled by two people sitting on a rock, dressed nearly in all white. Their faces were dirty, their appearance disheveled, and the man had a long, unkempt beard. Both seemed to be in their 40s. They looked like the couple that kidnapped Elizabeth Smart. What struck me as odd about the encounter was encountering anybody at all. I frequently went days without seeing a single human being. 
Their white clothes could be explained away by the need to escape the California summer sun. Their scruffy appearance could be explained away by the fact that most through hikers abandoned personal hygiene on the trail. After I said hello, they said nothing and just simply watched me as I passed. Even that I didn't find odd. I chalked it up to them being foreign and not really knowing what to say. I camped a few hundred yards off the trail that night, like I always did. Following bear precautions, I hung the leftover food that I'd cooked that night from a tree approximately five feet off the ground. Packing up camp in the morning, I noticed that the food wasn't there. I immediately thought that a bear had to have entered my campsite, so I began to look for paw prints. I didn't find paw prints, but I did find boot prints circling the campsite, two pairs of them. One of those prints led right up the rope which the food was hanging. I thought back to the couple that I passed earlier and everything clicked. I quickly packed up and left. My mind was racing the entire day, but I figured that couple was just simply hungry. If they had nefarious intentions, they would have come for more than food. Several more days passed. My mind was at ease again. I had begun to circle my campsite with sticks to wake me in the event of any intruders, animals or otherwise. I woke in my tent one night to the sound of those sticks crunching. I grabbed my hunting knife and that 20 gauge. Situational awareness is beyond important in encounters like this. There isn't any cell phone service. There isn't any help coming. If you hunt or hike alone, you have to be careful. You have to take every precaution and be prepared to adapt to some potentially f***ed up situations. Animals and people in the woods are unpredictable, so you need to know what your options are and what you're capable of inside these moments. I tried to relax by telling myself that in the middle of nowhere, the source of that noise is much more likely to be an animal than a person. Then I heard frantic whispering. It was impossible to tell which direction the voices were coming from, but in the dark, surrounded by trees, a hundred miles from the nearest city, it plays tricks on your senses. I debated yelling out to claim that I had a gun, but instead decided to remain silent and retain the benefit of surprise. I heard the footsteps circling my tent. I was ready to slash and shoot whatever opened it, but just like that, it was over. No more footsteps, no more whispering. I lay frozen awake in my tent until sunrise. I opened up my tent to find nobody there. The only evidence that something actually happened were boot prints, same as before. It's super ominous to find fresh boot prints that don't belong to you. I didn't need any more encouragement to completely abandon that area and move on to another. This was a serious cross country trip for me though. I was planning on hiking and bird hunting for the better part of 100 miles through various types of California terrain. Several more days passed. I was now in Shasta National Forest, probably 50 to 75 miles from where I first encountered the couple. The trail became more or less a goat trail, being on the side of a mountain and above the tree line. I could see the trail winding for miles in front and behind me. I stopped for water in the rear shade and noticed there were two hikers miles behind me. All I could see were two white dots moving along the mountainside. I immediately said out loud, this, this trip is over. The reason being that I could literally see these people in those weird white clothes. Who the hell wears white on a rugged cross country hike? I'll tell you who, a complete psychopath. They were like machines, steadily gaining on my position, no matter the terrain. They never looked up once, eyes glued to the dirt as they followed the trail I left behind. They were outdoorsmen, trackers at the very least. I pulled out my map and looked for the nearest town, which appeared to be Costella, located off I-5. The only problem was, it was 25 miles away. I hiked well into the night trying to gain as much ground as possible. I kept losing the trail and then decided to set up camp, this time far off the trail and into the forest. I got inside my tent, tried to get sleep, but Every little noise kept me awake. After a few hours inside my tent, I heard the telltale signs of another bad night. The footsteps, the whispering, the sticks breaking. 
Sound travels far in the absence of any other sound. I knew they were close, but wasn't sure how close. All I could think was, this is so messed up. Ah, damn. Finally, a flashlight hits my tent. It lights up the entire thing, and then goes dark. I unzip my tent and climbed out carrying my knife, yelling nonsense into the darkness. It was sort of like that cliche scene in movies where people in the wilderness hear sticks breaking around them, and then the camera pans around the trees, because the people have no idea which direction the sound is coming from. Then I heard footsteps running toward the tent, and barely made out a figure, moving inside my peripheral vision. I turned and ran deep into the forest. I tripped several times and ran into multiple trees. After running for approximately five minutes, I tripped, rolled, and came to rest next to a downed tree. I got under that tree trunk and lie still. I saw that flashlight moving around in the distance. I laid under that tree for hours. I was certain that they were gone now, but I still didn't move. Eventually birds started chirping, and I knew sunrise would soon follow. Once it did, I made my way back to the trail. I abandoned my campsite, and I walked the rest of the distance to Castella where the Pacific Crest Trail crosses I-5. I hitchhiked my way to the town of Mount Shasta and spoke to the police and forest reserve. They put me up in a motel for the night and my parents drove down from Oregon to pick me up the next day. I followed up with the police and forest service months later who told me that there had been similar reports of items disappearing from campsites throughout the surrounding national forest. However, there have been no other reports of the terrorizing that I experience. As far as I know, nothing else ever came of the couple. I grew up in a hunting and archery family. We own the largest indoor archery range in the United States, and my father is a three-time world champion, and my uncle is Butch Johnson, Olympic gold medalist. Anyone in this hobby makes it a lifestyle. They live it, breathe it, and would die for it. A family friend of a high reputation in the archery world told us the story that he experienced while hunting, and since then, has never entered the woods again. Again. I come from a long line of legendary archers, not just daytime sportsters, but people who have built their entire livelihood on skill and reputation. These are people with something to lose. What I'm saying is they aren't going to gossip about some bullshit when they know better. So back to this family friend. The story happened back when he was still hunting. He sticks mostly to indoor tournaments now, but he was known to bag him and tag him back in the day. Deer, elk, you name it. He killed it with a bow and a single arrow. He's in his tree stand alone, staring out into the woods in a small field, about 50 to 60 yards away. A doe has now walked out of the woods to graze on the grass. He raises his compound bow. He takes aim. But then from the other end of the field comes, and this is what he described it as, a large ape-like creature, close to eight feet tall, just booking it on two legs toward this doe. For the story, We'll say it's Bigfoot, but I'm going to tell you now that none of us actually believe that to be true. So this Bigfoot runs up to the deer, and before it even knows what's happening, it gets picked up from under one arm, under the deer's belly, and continues a full sprint into the woods at the other end of the field. The deer is screaming bloody murder as it's carried away by this unknown creature. Our friend is there, bow still drawn, shaking in shock questioning everything he knows about the land. The animal life there, he's used to hunting, everything. He'd been hunting this area for 25 or 30 years at that point in his career. He's a true stalker in the sense that he's in the place hours before the sun comes up, long before any prey is in motion. He's silent. He doesn't wear anything that carries a smell. He was a phantom up in that tree, and nothing knew he was there. The man was certain death up until this point. He refused to get down for the longest time until it started getting dark and he didn't want to be alone at night after seeing that. He gets out of the stand, left over $5,000 worth of equipment up there and sprinted back to his truck. We actually went back out with him to help collect it all. And that's when we knew something truly strange had happened. 
who would leave all that out there overnight? Only a person who's truly afraid. He stands by his claim and has never, not once, returned to hunting or the woods after being now in his mid-50s and spent his whole life around it. This is what sealed the deal for us. Someone we'd hunted with for nearly decades literally will never hunt again. The guy won't even hike or fish anymore. He doesn't think it was an actual Bigfoot, but the reality of not knowing what it was keeps him out of that woodland. Seeing it move at that speed, at that size, without making a single noise. As hunters, we can tell you it's impossible. When you're eight feet tall, or other things can usually hear you breathing. That's how you stalk a moose in the bush. Sometimes there's a curtain of birch, and you have to lead the animal blindly, using only when it's huffing and walking as a guide, until it turns the cover. Because when you're that big, every step is loud as hell. This creature didn't make any of those sounds, not even when it was at a full sprint. No breathing, no crunching leaves, just a simple thud through the earth that he actually felt more than he heard. After seeing it move like that, he shared a little bit with us, that it'd be easy for a person of any size to disappear with a creature that can move like that. Every hiker and hunter that comes up missing probably reminds him of that day. This is always the one that disturbs others the most for whatever reason. A quick background. I grew up in the forest, inside this tiny house in the Appalachian Mountains. Our house was more like a shack, and behind it was a large looming mountain. The nearest neighbors weren't far, but with the woods in between it, it sure did seem like it. My parents were in a band and left once or twice a week from about 5 p.m. to 2 a.m. to practice or go to a show. I was around 12, my sister was six or seven. We would pass the time by watching some old VHS tapes or just talking. One night my parents left and a torrential downpour started. If you know Tennessee, you know that a flood can happen at any time. I've had several pets drown from just being outside. We had a small closed in porch in which my mom's favorite dog Whiskers was tied via a 20 foot chain wrapped around this toolbox. It wasn't the most effective or even considerate method of retention but it served its purpose. We were poor. Whiskers was doofy and about as useless as a guard toad, but he had a loud bark and my parents' hope was that he would frighten intruders on sight. He was sleeping quietly on the closed-in porch until the wind came, which at the time was a complete roar. It caused the front door to come out from its hinges. Whiskers bolted off into the night. I yelled at my sister, I'm gonna go get him put on my dad's rubber mining boots and ran out. I didn't get a flashlight because, I don't know, I was a dumb kid. I was terrified for his safety, especially in the rain, and the fact that if my parents found out that their dog was missing, I would have had the shit beaten out of me. Lightning lit up the side yard, just enough for me to see him bolting down the bank and across the stream in the backyard toward the mountain. I ran after him. The creek had a quote unquote bridge, which was just a very thin wooden plank. I didn't even touch it, but left over it. My adrenaline was sky high. Now the lightning was gone, and I could only hear whiskers based on the dragging sound that his chain was making. Maybe 30, 40 seconds, and I was already soaked with rain, not a dry spot on my entire body. So I ran up into the forest. I lost the sound of whiskers. I was in a panic at this point, with the rain and a lost dog and so I numbly just scaled the slippery leaves as I ran. I called out. I made kissy noises as you do for a dog when you're 12. Then out of nowhere, it seemed like a shadow fell. I don't really know how else how to describe it. I couldn't see anything, but the black suddenly got blacker. And then I quickly realized something else. I could smell extra well, thanks to the rain. It really made things pungent. I smelled dead leaves. I smelled wet dog. And I smelled dog urine, which was not surprising. I actually got hopeful at that point because I knew he would be out trotting around, marking his territory and maybe, just maybe, I could find him. But the extra black just seemed ominous. I stopped calling or whistling. I felt anxious, like something else was in this forest with me. 
That's the exact feeling I got. And I stopped to listen. Living so close to Appalachia, you hear a lot of legends about what goes bump in the night, especially around here. We got it all from goat men to feral people, inbred ghouls and wendigos, backpacking serial killers, you name it. We got it all. I don't know what I was listening for, but it was just something more than my dog. A whistle, a voice, someone calling my name. My mind was racing with all the different myths that I'd heard over the years. I couldn't hear anything, but from above me, the crest of the mountain, I smelled something. It smelled putrid, rotten, like a carcass that had been sitting in the southern Tennessee heat all day long. I remember almost gagging, and my anxiety turned into true, actual fear. I knew how bears smelled, and how most animals smelled, actually. This was not something organic in an alive sense. It was a rot that smelled older than time, ageless, the decaying body of something that hadn't walked the earth in a very long time. I still couldn't hear any footsteps, but I got the sense that something was moving toward me. It was kind of like a vertigo, if that makes any sense. My body was not wanting to stay still at that point. I was frozen in terror, staring out into nothing, smelling rot, and feeling like I was being stalked. I've been stalked by a mountain lion before. It felt almost exactly the same, except with an extra dose of piss your pants fear. Then add the torrential rain, and I can hardly breathe out there. Too awestruck to even move. The lightning flashed again. I saw something impossible. The trees were lit up around me, but several feet in front of me there was a huge black void. It was a pure pitch black. In my peripheral, I could see really far around me, but in front, it was just like someone had sharpied the entire forest out. Right then I heard a dog barking, and whiskers sort of appeared out of nowhere from my right, insanely barking and heading towards that dark spot. The lightning went as fast as it came, and my only thought was, now it sees us. Somehow I had the sense to dive down and pick up Whiskers, and grab the long chain before he got too far. I had to yank him away. Keep in mind it's still raining loud as holy fuck, so loud that I'm sure nobody else heard him barking, but me, I was standing next to him, and I heard this guttural noise from the top of the mountain. It was more like a growl, and more like a rumble almost an earthquake sound. It was deep, and all my wet hair stood completely on end. I remember taking off, and I thought I'd have to drag the damn dog all the way down the hill, but he seemed to agree with my decision. I have no clue to this day, and one of the biggest mysteries is how we got through all of that forest without slamming into any trees. Black vision, downhill at a 70 degree angle, with slippery leaves, we were like superheroes there for a second. Superheroes who would probably have pissed our pants if we looked behind us. It was also incredible to me that in my dad's big clunky boots, I was able to keep pace with a running dog. But that's how frightened we really were. It was nothing but true animal instinct. We crossed that bridge, and I ran across it this time, hearing my footsteps thunk loudly and thinking to myself, oh man, that was loud as though we were being chased. We get back into the house. I chain the dog up. He's wet, shivering, and looking very remorseful for his bad decision. I scrambled into the house, getting a hammer and fixing up the door the best I could. It was a shack, like I said, so our lock was a piece of wood and a nail in the middle. I changed into some warmer clothes and sat back down, too scared to even say much. My sister was tired and quiet. It was late. She wanted me to put on a movie, but I stopped her. I still felt uneasy. We put the lights off. Trust me, it was far less frightening this way, because if the lights were on and it's pitch black outside, anyone can be watching you. So we sat in the dark living room and looked out the picture window at our rainy yard. We still didn't see anything, but there were flickers of shadows. Something was off. When the lightning appeared, there would be a mass either far or near that didn't light up just right. I took a flashlight and shined it out the window, and the same thing, it just ended. The beam was cut off, swallowed up by black spots. 
Whiskers usually was the type of dog to bark his head off at the mere sight of a butterfly, but he was now dead quiet. Our roosters all over the property though, we had at least 200, were all crowing. I remember that I had this superstition book when I was a younger kid, and inside that book it said if a rooster crowed at night, death was near, as in physical manifestation, medieval death. Since my dad was a cockfighter and a rooster expert, I asked him, but this was years before this incident, I asked him what a rooster crowing at night meant. His reply was almost as chilling. It means something is walking through them. If they were crowing and he was awake, he'd go out with his gun and almost always bring back a mink or a weasel or a snake. So roosters seem to have a pretty good alarm system. This night, when it was darker than dark, and the rain was pouring down in sheets. You could hear them all crowing and crowing constantly. I said nothing to my sister and she didn't know what the crowing meant. My sister ended up falling asleep and I stayed awake, staring out that window until my parents finally arrived home, complaining of the wet dog smell and shooing me away to go sleep somewhere else. They asked me what happened. I told them in about three words that whiskers got loose and I caught him quickly. They saw the door and luckily didn't blame me for that. They blamed the storm. I thought that was the end of it, but there was one more thing. The next day, my dad was very pissed off, yelling about hooligans wandering around in the rain. He also has a pretty bad case of paranoia. He thinks people are always out to get to him. I went out to see what had happened, feeling that whatever it was was probably due to the storm and not any kind of people. But he was angry because of that bridge, the long flat panel of wood was completely busted and splintered into pieces. Maybe a person could have smashed it, maybe, if they weighed 450 pounds, but the amount of splintered wood and knot edges seemed like it was from a sledgehammer or a freakishly large beaver with anger issues. I never had the stomach to tell him what I saw that night, because there was no way I could ever prove it. He was already a basket case, with some serious paranoia. I figured laying out the idea of a skulking dark evil entity coming out of the mountain probably wasn't a good move. Weird things continued to happen on that property for as long as we lived there, but I never saw that void ever again, and that's probably for the best. My buddy and I went hunting over a long weekend just a few years ago. We hiked into our hunting terrain and stayed inside a tent. We were in the middle of nowhere, inside the Norwegian wilderness, and we had exclusive hunting rights to that area, so we really didn't expect any other people to be there. No cell service within something like a 6 kilometer radius, and then another 10 kilometers back to our cars. It was isolating and breathtaking just to be out there. Relaxing is an understatement. We were camped next to a small lake and didn't see any other people there for the first couple of days. It was liberating to be that deep, to not hear so much as an engine throughout the day. The tasks that we had throughout the day were whatever we chose to do. Fishing, bird hunting, as well as other small game, and stalking elusive red deer. It was a catch-all that satisfied any urge that we might have. This also meant that we had a good assortment of equipment, including some shotguns, a few long rifles, and a pair of small caliber pistols for execution, knives, and axes for wood cutting. We were almost like a small army out there. On our last night, we were eating dinner next to our campfire. It was pretty late, so everything outside our immediate surroundings was completely pitch black. Suddenly we heard someone take a shot on the other side of the lake with what sounded like a rifle. We thought it was a bit strange since there shouldn't have been any other hunters anywhere close by, but we just figured someone was messing around further away than what it sounded like. We quickly forgot about it and settled back in to eat. After another five to 10 minutes, someone then took a second shot, which sounded like it came much closer to us. This time the bullet hit some rocks literally right next to us five meters or so. We both froze for a few seconds while looking at one another, and then just ran to our tent to pick up our shotguns. 
We then ran quite a ways into the woods and just hunkered down. After a few minutes, we heard another shot, and we were both pretty positive that that one hit our tent, which later turned out to be correct. We obviously had no idea of what to do. We couldn't call the cops since there was no cell service. It was completely dark. We couldn't really hike out of there without using our flashlights. It seemed like a terrible idea. So we ended up finding a downed tree with a little cave-like thing under the roots. We just sat there until morning. It was like being in a foxhole or something. I just sat there for hours, replaying that visual of the bullet striking those rocks just near our feet. If the shooter had pulled the barrel up an inch, that bullet would have buried itself inside my leg or my chest. I had phantom pains littering the places I thought would hurt the most. All the while, I'm waiting for more gunfire to start splintering the logs above me. It reminded me of the trench combat in the first great war. We packed up as quickly as possible and basically ran back to our cars where we called the police. It seemed like the cops took it pretty seriously, but nothing ever came out of it from that investigation. Still have no idea what happened to this day or who could have possibly done it. There is absolutely no reason for anyone else to be out there with the gun, unless they were poachers, which is almost unheard of in Norway. I've literally never been so scared in my life, and it definitely took a few years before we ever went back. Pig hunting in the bush in the Janolin, New South Wales in Australia. I'm sure you're at least somewhat familiar with the term bush, so I won't go too far into the logistics. It's incredibly isolated, no quick back way to anywhere, and there isn't any shade or water for shit. Everything is angry, poisonous, covered in spikies, and just plain wanting to kill you. Saltwater alligators are some of the most notorious, but, but almost anything can kill an unsuspecting outdoorsman out here. Kangaroo, koala bears, snakes, and lizards, and the list is nearly endless. It's afternoon at this point. We'd already been creeping through the bush for a couple of hours. No shots taken yet. But we come across a lot of fresh tracks and droppings, so we knew there was something nearby. In a single file lane, we zigzagged near a waterway to help cover the sound of our footsteps. That's when I feel a tap on my shoulder. I turn and my mate is pointing out the bobbing shapes of a pair of wild pigs. They look decent size, high energy, just trucking along near the brush. We fall in line and start to stalk them along the river. The pigs stop every few meters, start destroying the riverbank, rooting around, kicking up dirt and pissing everywhere. These pigs are pretty toxic to the environment out here and hunters don't think twice about dragging their mangy little carcasses back to their camp. It keeps the terrain intact for at least next season. So anyway, we're downwind and totally still. About 30 meters away in the brush, about to take our shots with our 308s, when the two pigs absolutely piss bolt away. We'd been tracking them for 20 minutes at this point, and none of this bolty behavior presented itself the entire time. Whatever had scared them really had made them jump because there's zero chance of us following them or even catching up. We stand up and shake our heads with no clue to what scared them away. I've never seen a pig go from zero to full flight without a gunshot at least first. We look and check the embankment, nothing. No snakes, no crocs in the shallows, no big birds of prey. We start to look around for hikers or maybe there's other hunters on the far side of the creek. Anything to explain that sudden getaway. Still nothing. We're pretty buggered at this point, decide to pack it in. It was a defeating day, but we'd seen sign of plenty of through traffic. There'd be no shortage of shots to take throughout that weekend. As you know, Australia is hot, but the bush is blistering. You can't carry on for more than a few hours without rest and water, especially hucking around your equipment. Our hunting sessions were about five hour stretches in the morning until about noon. On this first day, when we did most of our scouting, we started a little later so the sunset is starting to creep in. Just as we're walking back through some pretty thick pine forest, maybe a hundred meters away from the bank where we lost those pigs, we both hear a growl. I start to turn around, but I hesitate because part of me has no clue what I just heard. My mate plants his feet, shoulders his rifle, 
and just waits for movement, like some kind of war hero. I swear to God it sounded like a lion from an African movie. There's nothing in the Australian bush that makes that kind of sound. Nothing at all. There are larger than average kangaroos, and the occasional pack of dingoes, but they can't growl like this thing did. They don't have that kind of mass. I've never felt fear like I did in that moment in my entire life. Then I quickly realize, no bird song nearby, and we're pretty damn close to the evening chorus time. So we're standing for five minutes with our rifles out in the falling light. There's still no birds. Now we finally decide to head back to the fire trail where I park my ute at. It's a 30 minute walk in the dust. Our rifles are out and we're both jumping every time we hear anything. I still don't know what that sound was, but I will never forget how primally afraid it made us. Like evolution had programmed us to shit our underpants when hearing it. I have not hunted in that area since and that was back in 2006. My mate went back a time or two, but never found anything. No weird tracks, no massacred animals, and no more growling sounds. Just another thing trying to kill us in the outback. I was a young hunter when this happened. It was just my second time out, sitting in a tree stand with my uncle who'd been hunting his entire life. My dad worked a pretty demanding white collar job and lost touch with that side of his upbringing. So he just shipped me off with his brother to instill some core values. To paint you a picture, our stand was near the bottom left of this acre of land. We had two acres visible, one in front of us and the other to our right, which was mostly visible from the tree stand. There are channels of thick woodland that frame these acreages and we've got a perfect vantage point of multiple tree lines. The flatness also gives us that advantage in the chase. Hunters can lose track of their prey after the animal panics and bolts in whatever direction seems best. This can include up or down hillsides, through extremely thick foliage, or even off a cliff. If the shot is too far and the terrain is too treacherous to navigate quickly, the animal will escape and can't always be located. It sucks, but it's just the reality of what can happen out here. I was two or three hours in, waiting for some deer to show up. We heard a lot of different animals, from turkeys and foxes and all kinds of birds, and plenty of squirrels. Some of them even wandered by our tree stand, or even along the branches beside us. I was a city kid, so it was all quite amazing to my sheltered psyche. Eventually at the opposite end of the acre, a small deer came out of the tree line. I had my gun ready, just in case but my uncle signaled me to let it go. He explained to me later that it would be even an extremely hard shot for him to make. Also, the deer was still fairly small, maybe only a year old. So I just watched this cute deer munch away on the ground and wag its little tail for a few minutes. He told me it's likely his family was nearby. They would all wander into the clearing sooner or later. They might even use the yearling to push into the field as some sort of safety test. Let the little one poke around and see if anything comes after it. Again, just another harsh reality. It's run or be eaten for a lot of these critters. My uncle and I shared a smile. I was so surprised that our tree stand really worked and then, bam, out of nowhere, a bear lunges from the brush, absolutely annihilates this young deer, dead instantly. Its jaw wrapped around the neck and shoulders, totally immobilizing the deer. Claws render flesh so deep in the scramble that we can see some of the gore even from the long shot distance that we have. It pulls it back into the brush. All that motion and power took less than three seconds. I was in absolute awe. Even replaying it now in my head, I still just think to myself, what the hell? I was shocked, terrified, and excited all in the same time. My uncle, though, had the classic look of fear, probably because I was so young and he was there with him, but it was jarring regardless. He knew a bit more than I did though. He knew bears could climb trees almost faster than they could run. They liked climbing too. And we were apparently in prime country for such an encounter. The bear pulled in the deer in the underbrush and we looked down below and realized we weren't that high up. Not only are bears extremely rare in my area, but the fact that this one was huge and was patrolling around and hiding unseen and unheard of to either of us was just completely mind-boggling. 
I think about 30 minutes later, my uncle decided it was time for us to leave. We get down, pack up our gear, and head for the truck. He starts it up, and I'm walking around the back, taking my sweet time. I stretched and let the sun hit my face and the cool air into my lungs. I don't remember exactly why, but my eyes were just fixated in on one area. As if my brain knew it was seeing something, but I wasn't fully processing it yet. Suddenly, the mood in the air changed, and the cool air felt now dull. I actually started to sweat. I could sense something was wrong. I started to turn around and walk to the passenger door, but I couldn't take my eyes off this part of the tree line. Just before I got in, that same bear poked its head out from behind the brush. It was far away, but I could tell its mouth was covered in blood. It just stared. I closed the door and continued to look at it from the back window of the truck. My uncle noticed and looked as well. This time we were both just flat out scared. I've never seen or heard anything like that since, but it was a good lesson in understanding that you need to be alert and on your toes when in that kind of situation, 100% of the time. That bear was like a ghost, but hundreds of pounds and bloodthirsty. My dad used to fish with this traditional method of using many rods made of bamboo, placed five yards next to each other. The bait are usually live tiny frogs, and it's for catching a specific cat-like predator. Anyway, it's always done at night, and considering the method, he had to walk back and forth on the riverbank to keep checking the fishing rods. It's not so unlike how ice fishermen practice their craft. I learned this many years later in a documentary. Ice fishermen will bore their holes in a yard or five feet apart to evenly space their baits along the bottom of a lake or river. This ensures the fish to have ample room, to snatch the food and don't find it suspicious in any way. These little guys are more clever than we give them credit for. It was when I went along on one of these fishing trips where I got a memory worth remembering for as long as I can live. I was sitting on the riverbank next to our motorcycle, munching on snacks that I brought from home. My dad was around 70 or so yards away, doing another round of checking the rods. Suddenly, I heard my dad running toward me, and I swear I've never felt or seen such terror in someone's face, especially my father. I heard his footfalls and instantly knew something was wrong. I hesitated to look up from what I was eating because I knew it had to be him, barreling right at me. What was I going to see behind him? Was he going to be hurt, covered in blood? I didn't know what the hell to expect. He told me to hurry up and hop on the bike, telling me that we're going home. I was like, uh, what about the fishing rods? But all he did was fire up the motorcycle and speed us away. Honestly, I didn't really think much of it. I was a kid who really didn't enjoy anything in which I had to wait, and the night fishing trip was just not something I really enjoyed. So as much as I want to care, I was just happy to go home early. My dad did collect the rods in the morning though. It was also a huge relief not to have to deal with any of it. All those fears that cropped up in my brain turned out to be nothing and I was just content to leave it that way. As the week went on, I thought of it less and less until I really didn't care at all. But I never forgot though. I never forgot about that weird night where dad got spooked though. It wasn't until six or maybe seven years later in high school when my dad asked me to join him on another fishing trip. I asked my dad what actually happened that particular night. He got shaky and weird. A look of disbelief came across his face, almost like he couldn't believe that I remembered that. According to him, basically from where he was standing that night, up ahead the river, there was a curve to the right. The water cuts away, and there's this little wall of trees and brush that kind of creates this curtain along the bank. He had heard a little splashing in the water, meaning he caught a fish. When he went closer, he saw a long-haired woman in a white robe, squatting next to the fishing rod with her back to him. Thinking that someone is stealing his catch, he asked her what she's doing. He announced this in a stern way, as my father is a no-nonsense type of guy. She slowly stood up, rotating her body to the left to face him, only there was nothing for what was supposed to be a face. 
It's not like her face is shadowed, but with a distinguished structure of eyes and such. It's blank. Blank as the night. Like nothing to be seen. My dad froze up and that's when she said, Go home. That was when he fled. He said it was certain it was some kind of water spirit of some kind. And he was encouraging it to get back in the water and also explaining that he would leave. He said it was a ward of some protection against whatever he thought he was seeing. The only time I saw terror on his face is when he was looking for my mom and I in the bedrooms during a massive earthquake in 06. My mom and I were already outside. We saw him and thought why didn't he come outside. He was in a panic looking for us in every room. My dad was a teacher. He always had jokes up his sleeves, he even voted as the funniest teacher in his school years ago. But I know for sure when he's bullshitting me and when he's being serious. He's seen and heard some weird things in his life, some of which he's told me. He said that he reacted the way he did because a part of him wanted to get the hell out, obviously, and a part of him was too afraid that it was a bad omen or something, something might happen to our family. But thankfully, all he lost was nothing more than a few fish. He never saw that woman again and still fishes that same river to this day. He's probably in fact right there right now. I was out elk hunting with my dad. While we were glassing over one canyon, we saw a bear down at the bottom. It never gave me a shot, but it was the biggest black bear I've ever seen. Still not as big as a respectable grizzly, but plenty big enough to slice up yours truly here. It ambled around the canyon floor for a while, always perfectly keeping up a tree or rock between me and the shot that I needed, until it went out of sight. Well, we were obviously tempted to go after it, but ended up not doing so, looking for elk. Several hours later, we see a decent elk on the other side of the canyon. I shot it. We start down our side of the canyon and realize that it's way steeper than we thought. My dad damn near slid right off into a pair of rattlesnakes at one point. It takes us about 10 minutes to get down, a few minutes to cross the bottom, and then another 20 to get back up to where that elk was on the other side. As we're cleaning it out, we realize it's getting pretty late, and by the time we're done and starting back towards camp, the sun is now setting. We hit the bottom of the canyon and start walking across. Then we hear something, something big walking through the bushes a little ways away. It's at this point that we realize our predicament. We are completely in the dark, in the middle of a large bear's territory, carrying almost 100 pounds of raw meat, possibly with the bear getting pretty damn close to us. We start up the other side of the canyon as fast as we can, which is not easy because it's still so damn steep. Plus, we couldn't find where we first came down, so we had to push up through brush that was taller than us. It took us almost an hour to get up. The whole time, we kept hearing something in the bushes following us, along with some very bear-like breathing at some points. We hit the top and start walking as fast as we could towards camp, absolutely exhausted, still hearing whatever it was behind us while we were unable to see shit. We get to camp. My dad turned on this super bright LED lantern that we had. We were able to see that the bear was less than 50 yards away, staring at us. It followed us all the way back up to camp. He wasn't threatening, just curious. I didn't have a bear tag, so I didn't shoot it, but it definitely scared the shit out of me. We tied the meat up in a tree, keeping an eye on that bear, and stayed up for another half hour until it finally left. And at that point, we couldn't take it anymore. We crawled into the tent and crashed from sheer terror and exhaustion. We got up the next morning, looked around and couldn't find any sign of him, other than those tracks he left where he'd seen him. We were very happy to pack up and leave after that. The next season, we had a pretty crazy story as well. Some cross-country hiker had been attacked and eaten by a bear out of the exact area that we had our encounter. It's not hard to wonder if that was that same bear that tailed us now with more experience with stalking humans, and really got the jump on that guy. Almost, like the bear practiced its technique on us or something. It's probably not the case, but who knows. Fish and Game never found that bear, at least last I heard. I 
I had just hung a tree stand from a new tree in a new location, and I decided to hunt it that evening. It was just after Christmas, and I was getting a little stir crazy. I get there around 3.30 p.m. and sit till about 6. That's when it gets pitch black out. I then decide to climb down and head back to the cabin. As I'm climbing down, I started to hear coyotes howling and getting ready to go hunting for themselves. This isn't really a big deal. Coyotes are cowards, nothing but little packs of dogs. They aren't going to get close to a grown man, right? And if they do, a single boot to the head is all the encouragement they'll need to get away. You'd have to be hurt or starving for them to get to you. I start walking back for a minute or two, and that's when I hear something behind me. The only light I had was a dim little clip-on bulb attached to my hat. It was completely useless, only serving to light up the path before me. It didn't really reach out more than four feet, more a bubble to illuminate a space in front of my face. So anyway, I turned my sad little light on the trees beside me, and I saw five sets of eyes watching me in the trees, probably seven to eight feet away. Well, that's not good. I remember unslinging my rifle but realized how outgunned I really was. I'd get one round off and start to pull the bolt and the other six would be on me. It'd be better to use it as a club so I just strong gripped it and started backing my way through the trees, keeping my eyes on them the entire time. It was a pack of coyotes, they were literally stalking me. How did I know this? Because when I started backing away, the eyes lowered and started creeping slowly towards me. I managed to load my rifle. I started yelling, making noise to scare them away, but none of them ran. They just sat there, watching me. As I watched them approach, a couple of coyotes slunk off to either direction to flank me. I began backing up faster, moving my head all around, screaming, trying to keep them away. I felt phantom nips at my ankles, thought about how hard it'd be to make it back if they started with my legs and then tore out all my muscles. There's also another issue. I have this massive scope on my rifle. I couldn't see through it in the dark, so unless they came right up to me, I couldn't shoot. So instead, I just made lots of noise and continued backing away slowly until I was a good distance from the pack. Then I began running in the pitch black to get back to the cabin. Again, if they became a real threat, I could hip or shoulder fire, maybe tag them inside seven yards. I just didn't feel confident inside that outcome. They seemed set on making a meal out of my sweaty ass. I huffed another half a mile through the trees until I broke into a clearing. My truck's there, the cabin, and a humming little porch light welcoming me back. I get maybe 15 feet into the clearing. I turn back around and shoulder my rifle ready just in case they make one last ditch effort. I didn't know what to expect. All I knew is that I made it this far. They didn't come out, but I could hear them barking and yipping just beyond my sight. In the frenzy, coyotes sound like they're giggling, laughing, it's some creepy shit. It's unnerving. I stumbled into the cabin and locked up for the night. I keep a sidearm at all times in the woods now, and I know better than to fuck with the coyote. My name is Ben and I live in Australia. In the southeast of Australia lies the state of Victoria, and in that state lies the high country, an extremely vast and remote expanse of alpine mountains and valleys that are largely only accessible by four-wheel drive and can take up to days to get in and out. The place is popular with four-wheelers, deer hunters, and hikers. We four-wheel drive, and this was our destination chosen to go camping for a few days with my partner Jess. Some time away from the world beyond the reach of mobile phones was definitely needed. The four-wheel drive was loaded up, our list double-checked and vehicle maintenance done. Fuel was loaded onto the roof racks, and the police station closest to our destination notified of our trip. 
It's common for people to notify them. It's a safety measure, especially when not traveling in a convoy. Again, this is very remote country. We were headed to a place called Wanangata Valley, a remote valley deep in the high country and a huge amphitheater type valley with alpine mountains rising high in every direction and a river running along the valley floor. Towards the end of the first full day of driving, we made our way down to the last track for the day, skirting the ridge and arriving at the valley floor as the sun dipped down below the mountains. We found a secluded spot to pitch our tent, nestled in amongst the eucalyptus trees by the riverbank. It was midweek, an off season, so we're the only ones in the valley, at least that we knew of. After setting up camp and having a meal by the fire, the sun went down. We snuggled up together in our sleeping bags. In short order, we decided to hit the hay. At some point during the night, I woke up to a loud noise. Wasn't really sure what I'd heard from the inside of our tent, so I continued to listen. Nothing. Must be going mad. No sooner, I thought I heard another noise, and it sounded like something falling off of our table, hitting the ground. I put it down to possums or wombats. It's pretty common in the area, so nothing to worry about. Should have packed up after dinner, I thought, and then went back to sleep. Sunrise came and we slowly woke up. Needing to pee, I opened up the tent and jumped out. Looking around, something just came over me. A chill. It wasn't the way we'd left it. Instead of seeing two chairs together by the fire where we were sitting, one of them was by the table. And on the table was a loaf of bread that I swore I packed away again the night before. I walked over to the table to inspect it. A half-eaten piece of bread was just sitting there, with a very obvious chomp mark taking out of it. I flung the tent open and asked, Hey, were you up before me? Did you have some bread? No, was the answer I got. Jess got up and together we went through all of our stuff. Nothing was missing. But as we went to check our vehicle, I noticed the footprints. There was a bunch of them around the front of the car where the hood was. Most of the camp was covered in grass and this was the only spot that was just dirt. Had someone tried to open it? It was very distinct footprints, not mine or my partner's. Perhaps they'd already been there. These camping spots are used intermittently. Obviously, we weren't looking at the ground when we arrived the night before, especially with the setting sun. I don't think either of us wanted to admit what we were both thinking, that someone had been creeping around our campsite in the night, far from civilization. We discussed if a possum could have made those bite marks and argued about if one of us had left the bread out. Eventually discussed moving on and camping somewhere else. After much deliberation, we both just decided to stay. I had the rifle in our vehicle, which I guess gave me an overinflated sense of safety, which in hindsight was a very poor choice. As the day rolled on, the sun shining and with nothing eventful happening, I decided to walk across the valley floor about 800 meters to an old ruin of an isolated homestead, built by the settlers who ran cattle in the valley some hundred years ago. It's steeped in mystery. There's an old unsolved murder from 1917 that always captivates people. I read the plaque, took some photos, and started to wander back to our camp. As I neared the halfway mark back to camp, I noticed Jess walking across the field toward me. Must have gotten bored, I thought. As she approached me, it was clear that she was in a panic. Immediately, she started to tell me how she went down to the riverbank to wash the pots and pans. And as she looked up, she saw someone over on the other side of the river, watching her from deep in the bush. I had no reason whatsoever not to believe her. I asked what he looked like and got told, an old man, 70s, thereabouts, scraggly looking, in old tattered clothes. Apparently, the second she looked up, he turned and walked away, disappearing into the bush. I couldn't comprehend it. How the hell was anyone out here without a four-wheel drive or a dirt bike? And how would anyone get to that side of the bank without first crossing over from our side? There's days worth of damn near impossible to walk through bush on the other side just to get to where my partner saw him. We decide to jump back in the vehicle and drive along the length of the valley 
checking the dozen or so riverside camping spots as we went. I wanted to spot a camp, have my partner ID the guy, make sure he wasn't creeping, with our theory being that he might have been a hunter, off in the bush after a deer or something. They're making our way up and down the valley and not seeing anything else. We drove back to our camp and a loss to explain anything. As the sun started to set, my partner and I, quite shaken up, I grabbed the rifle and sat it next to us as we cooked dinner and chatted, having a few drinks to settle our nerves. Was it just that there's a lot of mystery surrounding the valley and homestead murders? We talked a bit and settled in a good foot warming in front of the fire. At some point, Jess needed to go to the toilet. I was asked to come with her to the spot behind a tree where we placed that portable toilet maybe about 50 meters from camp. Considering everything that had gone on, it was a no-brainer. Jess did her business, and we turned around and came back the other side of the tree. And that's when we saw him, standing at our camp, about a meter from the rifle that I had sitting against the table, was a man, old, check, scraggly looking, check, tattered old clothes, check. Jess squeezed my arm so hard I thought it was going to come off. Everything about her body language screamed, this is that same man. As we got closer, I could make out more odd things about him. He had part of a deer antler in his hand that looked like he'd been whittling away at it, and what looked like antler pieces carved to plug where holes in his ears were. Same goes for the bone-looking buttons that he had on his ratty old coat. He wore old leather shoes that look homemade. Good day, mate, he said. Fuck me, mate. You gave us a fucking heart attack, I said, officially shitting bricks. Where have you come from, mate? Everything okay? Just over yonder. You lot aren't hunting around here, are you? Looking directly at my rifle. Uh, we might, yeah, why? There's no hunting around here. Not enough deer as it is. Well... We hadn't decided on it, probably packing up anyway, I said, as I edged my way toward the rifle. Should put this away anyway, uh, didn't mean to spook you, mate, I said, looking for an excuse to get that rifle into my hands. It's all good, guns don't spook me, he said. I didn't imagine they would. I picked up the rifle by the barrel and held it like a walking stick, in an attempt to be non-confrontational breathing a sigh of relief. No offense, but you, uh, you caught us a bit by surprise. You gotta be the only one we've seen since we got here. Yeah, I saw you come in last night. Fucking bet you did. But coming up here for 40 years, beautiful spot, isn't it? Takes a bit to get down the valley, hey? Yeah, mate, look, no offense, but we're gonna hit the sack soon. Do you need a lift back to your camp? No, all good. Just out for a wander before I tuck in for the night. All the fire and thought I'd say good day. Anyway, better be on my way. And with that, he turned and walked off, parallel to the river and into the dark with no torch. That was officially enough to spook us beyond any ability to calm down. We decided to pack up in the dark and head out. And even if driving in the dark was monumentally stupid in this part of the high country, we got into the vehicle and drove out, taking us along the valley floor. We didn't see a single fire, a camp, a vehicle, nothing. We kept on driving. Halfway home, Jess, bored from the drive, flipped on the camera. No memory card. After getting home and telling a few people what happened, a friend's dad, an avid bushman himself, was the one to officially freak us the hell out. Oh, you, you met the button man. The what now? I said. The button man. He's an old bushman who goes out into the high country for months at a time. Hunts with a spear, appears out of nowhere, scares people, and has these buttons made out of bone. There's a heap of people gone missing up that way. Cops keep looking, but can't find a single trace. Campers, hikers... One camp was found burnt to the ground and a car left abandoned. I can't find any evidence at all. A quick Google confirmed it all. The missing people, the button man, the lack of evidence. 
police set out into the bush and found his camp. Spoke with that man, but have nothing else to go on. We don't camp in the valley anymore. Hell, we don't camp on that side of the high country anymore at all. Anyway, that's our story of how we met a button man. Myself and a group of friends went on a weekend camping trip. This trip stood out because the only creepy stuff that happened happened directly to me. Both incidents involved me and what I perceived to be a member of our friend group. Both times it had to do with my relentless need to always use a bathroom. This first encounter was in the middle of the night. Everyone was lounging around the fire when I decided to make the quarter mile trek to the campground bathrooms. There were other campers dispersed in the area as well as the light of the moon, so I didn't think twice about roaming through the woodland. I came to the fork in the path, with the alternative route leading back into an unused campsite. There in the dark, I could make out the rocky outline of the fire pit dead center in the clearing. The space was empty, but for whatever reason, I can't break my line of sight. Something dreadful was holding my attention. Then I see it, the unmistakable shape of a person stepping out of the tree line. The thing about this person is, as they walked, I could see that they had a very peculiar gait. They maneuvered through the brush until they spilled out onto the trail just ahead of me. I'm close enough to confirm my suspicions that this is a friend of mine from camp. The weird way of walking was a dead giveaway. Now that I can actually see him, there's no doubt in my mind. The issue is, he's meandering around the wrong camp, and now seems to be trying to lose me in the dark. What really confused me was how he managed to get ahead of me when he has such a hard time walking anyway. I chalk it all up to some kind of prank. I tried to get his attention, to which his only response was, Stop following me. I told you guys I was going to the bathroom, was my only response. Why? Why are you following me? He whispered it, but it sounded more like a hiss in the dark. It was his voice, but it wasn't at the same time trying to catch up with him, but no matter how much I sped up, he stayed the same distance from me. This is all troubling because I can't stress this enough. My friend's legs and hips barely worked. I eventually lose him in the shadows just as I arrive at the toilets. I do my business, wash up, and then walk back to my camp without any incident. When I arrive, I find that same friend sitting in the same spot as when I left. Everyone claims that he never left, and I was alone the whole time. Again, I just accept it as a prank amongst friends during that weekend outing. So fast forward to about 3 a.m. Everyone is fast asleep. The fire is long dead. Again, I need to go to the bathroom. Since it's late and I only have to pee, I decide to forego the long trek to the bathrooms and just water a nearby tree. I step out into the darkness and find a place to run my errand. As I'm doing so, I hear another tent unzip and then re-zip behind me. I know it's one of my friends and I don't give them any other thought until I get back into the clearing. It's that same friend I saw creeping around the other campsite. He's standing in a strange way. He stood attempting to light a cigarette. I can see his face in the flint spark just behind his hands. His dark eyes stare at me in a way that I can't explain. Unblinking, unwavering, He doesn't speak until after the cigarette catches and he takes a puff. Can you hear me? He asked. I started to say yes, but I hesitated. Could I hear him? Certainly I saw the motions of his mouth, but the more I replayed what he just said to me, the more unclear it became. It was as if he spoke to me underwater, faint and distorted. I simply nodded. Can you hear me? He asked again this time a little more clearly. Yeah, man, what's up? Can you hear me? When he asked this time, he's speaking so loudly that I can't move, like some sort of audio shock. The best way to describe it was deafening. Yeah, dude, are you trying to wake everybody up? I asked him. He kind of shakes his head and gives me a repulsive look, puffing on the cigarette. I watch as he turns and stumbles toward our parked vehicles maybe 30 feet away. 
He starts to turn around the back end of my car. When I realize they're pulling a prank on me again, I charge after him around the car, only to find myself alone. The parking lot was empty, save for the shadows of the trees. There wasn't even a wisp of the cigarette he'd been smoking, not even a hint. I return to camp and find his tent zipped up, his boots unlaced before the door, and I can actually hear him snoring inside. I went to bed and decided not to mention it in the morning. If it was a prank, like I thought, they'd surely bring it up. No one ever did. My girlfriend at the time and I went camping five hours away from home for her birthday and our anniversary. We made the trip the day after a big storm had passed through. We left town early and got there in the early afternoon. This meant we had plenty of daylight to pick a perfect spot and spend some time setting up. The guy at the entrance to the campgrounds mentioned that there was no one else staying there. This is going to be unreal, my girlfriend said, and I couldn't help but agree. First, we drove down these long pathways to our designated area, and as we got closer to it, the road tapered into a dead end. This meant in order to leave, we'd have to back out in reverse. There was no quick way to leave our campsite. We unloaded the car, got the tent set up, and decided to walk around the woods. It was dead silent, but it was still bright out, so we just took in all the nature we could, walked a few miles away. We reached this point in the woods where there were some weird looking white cabins. They were very uniform, all built the same exact way. Like, I guess they were part of this camping ground, but they seemed way out of the way and there was no sign of life. It felt eerie to be at, like we shouldn't be there. And the only way I can describe them is sterile, the opposite of what you'd expect at a campground. So we just turned around and walked back took a breather in the tent, then tried to start a fire in the fire pit. Unfortunately, neither of us had ever been camping before, and we had no idea how to start an actual fire. We had bought some of those self-lighting logs from Walmart and some lighter fluid, but everything around us was soaked to the bone from the rain that had passed through the day before. We knew we needed some form of kindling, but any dry sticks or leaves were far and few between. It slowly began to occur to me how unprepared we were for really anything. The reality of the fresh storm, isolated wilderness, and the lack of real supplies had me on edge. Eventually, we got a small fire going, ate hot dogs and marshmallows, and spent some time looking at the stars. That's when we noticed just how dark it was out there. My girlfriend was easily spooked and asked, Can we get into the tent now? So we put the fire out and crawled into our tent. We were talking to one another, but I could tell she was tense. Suddenly, she put her hand over my mouth and asked, Shh, you hear that? Before I could respond, we heard footsteps. Heavy footsteps. It sounded like a group of people walking. I whispered back to her, It's probably just animals or something. Then we heard mumbling, like low mumbling. We couldn't make out words, but it didn't sound like a sound that animals could make. It sounded like words, but hushed and non-elaborated. We sat in silence, staring at one another in the dark for what felt like forever. The mumbling got louder, as did the footsteps, until it sounded like it was right outside of our tent. We both froze. I don't think either of us were breathing. I was hoping it was a drunk overnighter stumbling between camps, but all I could remember was the ranger at the entry station informing us that we were alone this weekend. It briefly occurred to me that the person we were hearing was actually maybe the ranger himself. At the end of the day, he was the only person who knew exactly where our camp was. And then, silence. We waited and waited and waited. Still not sure how much time passed, until eventually, my girlfriend said, We have to get to your car. 
The adrenaline was pumping, so I peeked out of the tent into the darkness and told her to stay behind me. Then we ran to the car. I locked the doors and she said, What the f*** was that? We can't stay here. No one is out here but us, but what was that? I kept looking around for any signs of life, but we were seemingly alone. I looked at her and was like, okay, I'm going to grab our stuff. You stay in the car. We only had our ice chest and our tent. I hopped out and ran, grabbed the ice chest, tossed it into the back seat. And as I turned around to go get the tent, I started hearing those footsteps closing in again. In a moment of pure terror, I yanked that tent out of the ground, wrapped the tarp around it, and slung it over my shoulder like some panicked Santa Claus, and then shoved it into my trunk. I didn't say anything when I got into the car except, do we have everything in here? My girlfriend said yes, and I floored it out in reverse out of that camping area. And when I say floored it, I mean that I slowly backed down the trail at a snail's pace. There is no quick way to escape going backwards in the dark. Then we came to a fork in the road that went in like six different directions. I asked my girlfriend if she remembered which path we came down to get in here. She told me she didn't know. We ended up choosing a random one and ended up in some kind of different camping spot. I cursed under my breath and slammed into reverse again. Then I noticed the angle we'd exited from. I could see the main path back to the gate, thanks to a small sign behind an overgrown bush. As we hightailed it out of there, I noticed there was a single, small green light out in the woods to our right. It was near where our designated spot was. It reminded me of the fake logs we brought. The paper on the outside burned green when they first started to catch, just like the green glow I could see now. I'd left those logs by the fire pit, and it seemed like now, someone was using them. We drove the entire five hours back to our hometown and fell asleep on my girlfriend's parents' couch at around 4 a.m. We never talked about that trip throughout the rest of our relationship, and I haven't had any desire to camp since. When I was in high school, my friends and I went to a really remote spot in the mountains to camp. Just to get there, we needed a pretty serious off-roader. It was about 30 miles up a super rough road. There were river crossings, huge boulders in the road, and tons of sand pits. Isolated would be an understatement for this part of the world. This road took us all day, and all day. We didn't sing a single other person. No one passed us. We didn't see anyone camping, nothing. At this point, one of my friends noted it looked like no one had ever driven on the road in a while. We found that weird because this was in Colorado. The roads and trails like this are really popular for recreation. Something also worth pointing out. This road led into a box canyon, which is basically nature's cul-de-sac. The roads we were on were the only road in and the only road out. All around us were massive cliffs and cell phone service was a good 25 miles away. With all that said, we eventually got to the spot and set up our camp. Every time we went camping, we played capture the flag, and this trip was no exception. We waited for it to get dark and then started the first round. In the middle of the second round, me and one of my teammates hop up on the road, which ran parallel to the area we were playing in. It seemed like a good way to get around to the other flag. Walking down that road, we began to see a glow coming toward us. Our first thought was it's another 4x4 coming into the canyon, but as it got closer, we realized that it wasn't a vehicle of any kind, but a young woman holding up her phone, looking for service. She was still at a distance, but we could tell that she was panicking. She was rushing and stumbling at the same time, and she didn't seem drunk. It was weird. So we called out to her. Hello? No response. But it wasn't that she ignored us. It was more like she didn't even realize that we were there. So we tried again. Hey, are you okay? Nothing. As she's passing us, we realize she's crying and again. Are you okay? She stumbled right past us, never showing a single sign that she saw us. 
The whole time, she's just looking at her phone for service. My friend and I are frozen. We watch her go, still stumbling and still crying. She rounded a turn and then disappeared. I yell out to everyone to meet us back at camp, and we do. I tell them all what we saw, and I'm not proud to admit this because it did seem like she needed help, but we got creeped out. We said we'd stay in camp that night and in the morning, we'd go looking. The first thing that we do in the morning is decide there must be some other people camped down the road. They must know her. So we went down to the end of the road. There's no sign of anyone. So then we decide to go to the entrance of the road and look for that woman again. We make the all day drive back to the canyon entrance and don't see a sign of anyone. I still feel guilty for not trying harder to help her, but thinking about how she got in that position, it just doesn't make sense. She didn't look like a hiker. She'd on regular jeans and a sweater. If she'd gotten in the canyon from the other side, it would require a very technical descent. She would have needed gear and didn't even have a backpack on. We were pretty sure we were the only ones that had driven down that road in a while, so it's not like someone just dropped her off and left her. And the whole time we saw her, she was holding up her phone looking for service. If she knew the area at all, she would know that there was no way she was going to find any. My friends and I never found her and still don't know what to make of it. We've gone back to camp on and off over the years, but that trip still stands out for every single one of us. Arizona, as well as many other states across the country, utilize an outdoor youth program called Wilderness Therapy. In the summer of 1991, I went on one such hike, which was 63 days through Tonto National Forest. We were teenagers, many of us delinquents or otherwise troublemakers. This was an isolation program where all of our focus and energy went to daily survival. We ran into people once during that entire 63 day trek, and it was early in on this trip. This was the most remote place I'd ever been at the time, as there wasn't any civilization for at least 75 miles in every direction. During one leg of the trip, our group was hiking through a canyon, using a river called Clear Creek to navigate the terrain. This is an extremely rugged area without any kind of trail system or campsites. The canyon was actually a slot canyon, meaning almost totally vertical slopes on either side, and the river itself was full of boulders and other treacherous obstacles. It was extremely slow going during this portion of the trip. One day, as we're all moving through the canyon, a few of us spot a suitcase up ahead. It's balanced atop a rock well, above the water as if it were placed there. We fished it off the ledge and popped it open. We found it stuffed with women's dresses, wigs, shoes, and some cans of soda and non-perishables like stew and chili. We're looking up and down the river, but again, there aren't any roads or paths of any kind for miles. The hiking guide for the trip suggested it fell out of an airplane, but we inspected the outside and found it totally intact. It would have been pulverized if it had fallen thousands of feet into a bed of stone. Not a single blemish. Our next theory had to do with the river. Arizona has a season called monsoon, where it rains all over the state. We thought maybe a flood picked up the suitcase from a camp upstream and brought it down this way to where we found it. Again, the suitcase was atop a rock well above our heads by six or eight feet. It wasn't waterproof and everything inside seemed undisturbed. There's no way it had been caught in a flood. We left it where we found it chalked it up to a mystery. Who would bring wigs, dresses, and high heels in a suitcase to a place so remote? It definitely creeped us all out to no end. The part I think about the most are the cans. If the suitcase had been deposited there, maybe someone planned on disappearing that summer in 91, and that was one of their waypoints. It still creeps me out to this day.
My buddy and I decided to hike the Grand Canyon when we graduated high school. Being dumb 18 year olds, we chose the trail based on its high difficulty rating. It's called the Tanner Trail, but last I read, the trail had been partially wiped out by a massive landslide. It was a beautiful but exhausting hike. We did this in late June, so temperatures down in the bottom of the canyon were approaching 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Like I said, this was a poorly planned hike by a couple of dumb high schoolers. The final approach to the Colorado River was along a dry creek bed, what we thought was Tanner Creek. We rounded a few boulders and approached the river. We hadn't seen a single human being the entire way, so we were totally relaxed as we hiked. When we reached the river, we walked up on a man that I can only describe as a stereotypical Native American man in his late 20s or early 30s. He had long black hair, a denim shirt tucked into his jeans, almost a Lou Diamond Phillips from Young Guns look alike, if you've seen that movie. For a second, I actually thought he was a set extra. Just stumbling across this man at the bottom of a massive canyon on a totally empty trail was odd. Is there a film crew here somewhere? As we walked toward him, he didn't notice or even acknowledge us, we sort of spaced out. He looked up and we exchanged a nod of greeting. Then we saw what he was doing. He was throwing a racket ball into the rapids at the foot of the creek. The rapids carried the ball downstream for six or eight feet before shooting it into a stone. The ball struck the stone with such force that it bounced out of the water, through the air, and landed back in the native man's hand. It sounds like a parlor trick or maybe impossible, but as I watched him, I felt like I was watching magic. That's when I noticed his appearance, and not his clothes, but the physicality. Like I said, we had to take a dry creek bed for several miles to reach the river. The whole canyon floor in the area was a dust pit, but this guy was miraculously clean, and a speck of dirt on him. The other factor was the lack of sweat. No beads, no stains, nothing, and it's well above 110 degrees. The situation was becoming more and more surreal. In our worn out state, we just wanted to find somewhere to set up our camps, so we said hi, said goodbye, and then walked upstream. He said hi, and then walked downstream, and we never saw him again. It didn't occur to us until later to wonder how in the hell he knew he could do that little trick with the ball, and not just how he was doing it, but how did he know it would work? We didn't sleep well that night, but nothing more came of this encounter. All right, <clears throat> this is number number six. I had a weird paranormal encounter when I was camping with a few friends in Okanagan Falls, British Columbia, Canada. We were camping to celebrate my 13th birthday and the girls and I had walked down to the lake for a swim. On the walk back to our campground, we walked along the river that had a fair sized dam. Unfortunately, there was an incident where two brothers drowned after being unable to escape the turbines a few years earlier. The dam had been marked with a skull and crossbones and large signs saying danger. After swimming and splashing for a bit, we decided to call it a day and head back. I needed to use the bathroom, so my friends waited at the base of the path as I walked up to the toilets. Just as I started to enter the building, a figure stepped out of the opposite doorway. It was a boy in swim trunks still dripping from his swim. He stood totally rigid without any expression on his face. I opened up my mouth to say hello, and the second I did, he strolled right by me back toward the lake. I just shrugged and went about my business. When I reunited with my friends, I asked if they saw the other boy come by, and they said they didn't see anyone. We listened for a moment to see if we could hear him, but all we found was silence. We were a couple hundred meters down the river and close to our campground when I saw an incredibly clear and bright white figure of a portly preteen boy walking atop the water. I stopped and told my friends to look, and one of them did, exclaiming she saw him too. The other covered her face and said she was too scared to look. 
We watched him for a few minutes until he faded away. He walked along the river's surface slowly for about 10 meters and disappeared. He didn't disappear in the trees though. To me, it looked like he slipped right through the surface of the water. It wasn't the same boy that I saw at the bathrooms, but he did look similar. Similar enough that he could be brothers. It's still the most incredible supernatural encounter I've ever had. In my youth, I was a wildland firefighter in the Southwest. One season, I was working through the backcountry in rural Arizona. Part of the forest was big for recreation, but the southern end, where we were stationed, was beyond remote. Few roads and no campgrounds, so if you wanted to recreate, you had to work for it. There was barely any tree coverage from the afternoon sun out there. Our fire crew had two duty stations. One was in town, and the other was two and a half hours up a windy, treacherous mountain road. The outlying station actually had a nice setup, the fire response building, an old forest ranger station, and a new double wide trailer for us to crash in. This was 20 plus years ago, so cell service wasn't possible out there. This forced the various fire teams to come up with different activities to keep us busy. We had a nice television set up inside for movie nights and horseshoes and other games outside around the fire pit. It was fun and cozy if you had the right team out there. I'll keep my story simple, as it goes hand in hand with other stories from my captain. It was the night of July 4th. We weren't on a fire, but with the holiday, we really didn't know what to expect. We were tossing horseshoes and playing music, just generally having a good time. We had a physical training hike early the next morning, so there's no beer or alcohol of any kind. This meant everyone was turning in early. I had my own small room in the trailer and had one of the only windows in the joint. It faced away from the station, overlooking the wilderness. As I began to doze off, a voice sounded outside of my window. It's one of my coworkers, one of the last I saw still awake. I stirred myself awake to hear him asking me to come outside over and over again. I was laying on my side, facing the window, so I looked up at the glass. I couldn't see him because it was still so dark, but also because the land kind of drops off on that side of the trailer. Still, I could hear his voice and just feel his presence outside. Get out of here, man, he encouraged. I didn't respond and instead just closed my eyes. Hey, come out here real quick. You gotta see this. Can you come out here? No, I finally answered. His voice changed after I spoke. It was faster, deeper, agitated. I could feel the anger seeping through the wall somehow. I knew if I opened up my eyes, I would see a hand in the window, beckoning me outside. The hand would be dropping down from above not arching up from below. Got the feeling that whatever was pretending to be my captain was incredibly tall, and that's why I couldn't see it. It started swearing at me, making me sweat. I lay frozen for what felt like an hour or two as it continued to bark at me in that voice. I eventually fell asleep from fatigue. I brought this up to the crew the following morning, as I transparently could. Everyone assured me they all went to bed shortly after I did and no one was wandering outside the trailer. No one else heard or saw anything. We dismissed it as sleep paralysis. Only after we returned, my captain took me aside and told me his own weird story. Again, he assured me that he'd never been outside my window. He went on to explain that a couple of months prior, he'd been cowboy camping a couple of miles from the fire station. This means no tent and limited supplies. He and several others were watching for lighting fires in that area. One night, as he's laying in his bedroll, a heavy drop of mucus lands on his face. He assumed that it was sap or owl poop and did his best to clean himself off, but it dripped on his face and his head for the whole night. He shined his flashlight and even screamed to ward whatever it was away moved his bedding to a clearing away from the tree line. 
and it still dripped on him somehow. He waited for dawn, broke camp, and made for the station and never told another soul. What was interesting was, I'd actually noticed that he'd stopped taking outdoor overnight duties a few weeks prior. Our captain was usually the first to volunteer for weird solo jobs like that. He didn't really camp at all after he told me that story. We don't know what happened to either of us, but at the time, we felt like they were related somehow. I enjoy taking solo camping trips. Easy way for me to just relax and chill. I went up into the mountains yesterday morning and set up my tent in a campsite near a pretty popular mountain range that was near me. I had zero Christmas plans, so I thought I would go camping instead of just sit at home. I also thought it would be awesome time because I imagined there would be very little people at the site with me. I was in fact correct, but surprised that I was actually the only person there. Everything was totally fine. I was enjoying myself. I decided to call it an early night since I did a pretty large hike earlier and it completely wore me out. At about 8 p.m., I started to clean up everything and got inside my tent to wind down for the night. I passed out quickly, but about 3.15 a.m., I woke up to the zipper of my tent, very slowly unzipping. A super light sleeper on these trips because I stay on guard because I'm alone. I also placed my head by the entrance of the tent for this very reason. I woke up and immediately understood that someone was trying to come into my tent. I have a handgun that I bring with me for protection, but I've never actually fired it outside of at the shooting range. Not once have I been in a situation where I needed to, so my adrenaline immediately shot up. I slowly grabbed my handgun and faced it towards the entrance and decided to announce myself. I yelled out, I have a gun and I will shoot you in five seconds if I don't hear you run off right now and leave me alone. It was silent for about three seconds until I heard someone start running off. I kept my handgun facing the entrance for about 10 minutes, just waiting to hear any sort of movement at all. I heard nothing, so I grabbed my phone and called the police. They told me they were around 20 minutes out, so I just sat there in defensive mode just waiting. When the cops arrived, I came out of the tent and announced that I was the caller. I gave them my story and they decided to look around the area a little. Not even 15 feet away, they found some dude trying to hide in a tree. They came out to find it was some dude who had took mushrooms at another campsite nearby, on one of the sides of the mountain, and was lost after walking around and thought my tent was his. He was younger, maybe in his early 20s, and I could tell he was pretty shaken up. They arrested him, and as they were throwing him in the back of the car, he yelled to me, Man, I'm, I'm sorry about that, that was my bad. They asked me if, if I wanted to press any sort of charges, and I told the cops not to worry about it. I was pretty pissed about it, and even if this dude was lying about thinking it was his, I knew that he was harmless and it was just some dumb dude who was high. Regardless, I packed up all my stuff and left the campsite. There was absolutely no way I was going to fall asleep after something like that. I worked in Alaska for a bit as a member of the park service. One day, we got a call about some illegal dumping on one of the local trails, so myself and another employee went out to investigate. We were fairly deep into the trails, not too many people around except for a few joggers. When we came around a turn on that path, as we were walking, my partner looked into the woods and said, what the hell, there's a guy over there. About 20 yards away, there was a white guy with longish hair, crouched behind a bush and just staring at us. It was very strange to see him there. I remember just kind of going still, getting that fuzzy feeling you get from fear. Like I said, it's not like we weren't encountering folks out there. There was trail joggers, dog runners, generally just people on the move. The only folks that we'd seen trailside had set up a little place to relax and have a snack, clearly out in the open. 
All of these folks said hello as we passed and had a receptacle for the trash. This guy was none of those. He was clearly trying to hide from other people on the trail and his demeanor just wasn't what you'd expect from someone outdoors. It kind of reminded me of Gollum from the Lord of the Rings. The creepy way he'd just crawl around. This guy looked like that, just wearing a lot more clothing. The long stringy hair really freaked me out too. We're in Alaska, so the last thing you're expecting to spot in the bush is a skinny little white guy. When my coworker nodded into the trees, I was half expecting a wolf, a bear, literally anything else but a person, hiding. And that's when I remembered the crime at hand, the illegal dumping, and realized that hiding in the bush would fit the bill. No one's trying to get caught with a hefty fine for something so stupid. The man noticed that we noticed him. He immediately stood up and stretched out his arms in the air like he was enjoying the day. He then approached us, and it turns out that my coworker actually knew that man in the woods. He was a local builder or owned a construction company. In fact, he'd built a deck for my friend the year prior. After they said their hellos, he mentioned that he just stepped off the path for a moment to take a leak. It was definitely strange though, because we'd seen him. That definitely wasn't what he was doing. But he wasn't that suspicious and my coworker knew him, so... After making sure he wasn't illegally dumping anything, we started walking back. He actually walked with us for a fair while. The best way I can describe this man is like a chameleon. Just one of those people who will do or say anything to just agree with you. The type of guy who desperately wants you to like him. He told us about his construction company, how business was going. When we didn't seem that interested, he told us about his career in the military. That struck me as off, considering the behavior we just witnessed. What was an army vet doing squatting on the woods, watching people on a trail? It seemed like a red flag, but again, the guy made an effort to charm us, so I didn't think anything else about it. When we asked if he'd seen anyone illegally dumping anything, he went into these theatrics about all the manner of stuff that he'd seen. It seemed over-exaggerated, even made up, as he threw up his arms around and told us about this and that. Mostly stranger men and women on the trails at night, chasing people, unloading garbage by the truckload. A few years later, I heard that the man that we'd seen had been arrested. Apparently there'd been some sort of altercation with a girl at a coffee shop, or so I had initially been told. He shot her in a robbery and then was under arrest for murder. The truth was even more bizarre. The man, Israel Keys, was a serial killer who'd actually abducted, tortured, and murdered the girl. After being arrested, it turns out that he'd been traveling around the country, murdering people randomly for years. He would bury murder kits and then come back sometimes years later to dig them up. They would include guns, cash, etc., whatever he needed. My coworker had the best theory. He thought that the initial call about the illegal dumping was someone who'd seen Keys digging a hole to bury his murder equipment. After he realized that he'd been spotted and some of the equipment in that hole would likely be traced back to him and multiple crimes, he decided to intercept whoever came to investigate. That way he could keep an eye on where they went and ultimately turn back around for them. If that were the case, his plans worked perfectly and would also explain why he walked with us for so long. He was ensuring that we didn't double back and accidentally find his half-buried bag of bloody tools. I went back later to where we come across Israel, in those woods, to see if there was any such kit buried there, but I didn't find anything. Others suggested he might have been waiting to surprise a victim on the trail, but that didn't seem like his general MO, as was my understanding. Anyways, our encounter is something I've never totally been able to explain. And since he killed himself before the trial, I likely never will. Honestly, it's probably for the best. That guy allegedly abducted and murdered somewhere in the ballpark of 11 men and women, teenagers, even children. He traveled the country seemingly at random, didn't keep a victim profile in the sense that people he chose had no significance. It seemed to be a case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time, kind of like how we encountered him out there in those woods. Israel was an incredibly violent and accomplished killer. He did home invasions, set buildings on fire, executed bank robberies, and that was all on top of abducting and assaulting women in various states. He eluded authorities for at least 15 years, maybe even longer. When I 
was younger, I volunteered for the search and rescue in the town I lived in. I was a hiker by nature anyway, had some knowledge of the local terrain, so it just made sense to volunteer my time when necessary. The region I lived in wasn't known for high profile missing persons. We did have consistent missions through the late summer and fall, which is when I would get tapped the most. One autumn, I got the call on a person who disappeared relatively recently. He was with a group who returned from a hike without him and immediately called it in, rather than look for him. Volunteers got the call on these missions a lot because of the quick turnaround and somewhat light nature of it. These people usually just turned around or got off the trail a little bit, maybe even injured. It was a very high probability for a successful extraction, so they got all hands on deck as quickly as possible. All volunteers were assigned to the park rangers or search and rescue operations. They split us up in groups of three to a lead, which divided out into 20, even groups of four. There are a lot of heads bobbing in the dark looking for this guy. Our team works a sloping ridge that takes us back onto a plateau. A lot of us know this wedge pretty well, and they have us moving in your standard grid search. There's walkie-talkie chatter and distant beams of light throughout the canyon, spread out every quarter mile. We quickly recognize the lights that are moving as search and rescue, and the lights that are stationary as campers or ranger stations. We're on the lookout for any big fires or strobing lights reminiscent of an SOS. Hikers get creative when they're lost overnight. Our lead is on contact with the teams east and west of us. Then they switch channels for the overall contact between all teams. It was a super organized unit back then, and it made me proud to be involved, even if I was only fair weather. Weekend warriors is what they would call us, although I distinctly remember this mission was on a Tuesday night. Whatever the case may be, our team of four felt like we were going to be one of the ones to find this guy. Call it a hunch, but we just had a feeling that he was in our square of the grid. It was all an alluring little pass along the foot of the mountains. From the base, it looks like a simple, gentle slope, something that promises a great view. The reality was, it was steep, jagged, and much further down than it looked. This ridge had switchbacks that could make you think one direction was the other. Once you got to the plateau, it was so flat and wide, you'd think you were on the foot of the mountain not at the 7,000 feet elevation. Also, we could hear something moving in the brush periodically. Off trail was pretty overgrown, so in a dead silence, you could hear someone walking a quarter mile away. We'd stop now and again and listen, and to all shout his name together a couple of times. We thought we might have heard a response once, real faint, and up the ridge from us. Once we got to the top of the plateau, we could hear the stomping around in the tree line ahead. Animals aren't going to do that with a group of humans just a few hundred yards off, sweating, yelling, and shining flashlights. The animals are long gone by the time we even enter the area. We're confident whatever was cruising around was human. But as we crested the lip and got onto the flatland, the radio channel buzzed with all kinds of chatter. A group across the canyon found him along a dry spillway, pretty much the opposite of where we thought he was going to be. We were glad he was recovered no injury and en route to treatment, but we were a little disappointed after hyping ourselves up. Plus, there was the stomping around the trees that we heard. All of us linger along the ridge top and just listen, waiting to hear whatever it was again. It never sounded again though, and after 10 minutes of looking at the stars, we began the slow descent back down to the trailhead, where the command post was set up. Once we got about halfway down the face, we'd actually be able to see spotlights to guide us the last mile or two. As we approached that halfway point, we could see a light much closer to us, maybe just a few hundred yards down the face. We weren't navigating by a map trail, but a series of game trail switchbacks that got us to the top much faster. As we climbed, we moved out in a spread formation to comb the area, but since he'd been found, we just came down as a unit. We stopped when we saw the light, it was eerily bright. One of the other volunteers suggested that maybe it was the group to the east of us, lagging behind and just waiting. They could probably see our lights zigzagging through the trees on our slow descent. It wasn't uncommon for teams to rendezvous on return trips or even during a search. It could get creepy and lonely out there in the dark. The more the merrier is always the philosophy. The park ranger we're with. Links into the channel shared only teams east and west of us. 
He reports in and asks if there's another team near the position that we can see. A moment goes by. They respond. And it's clear as day. These guys are two and three miles ahead of us, respectively. One group has pretty much made it back to the command post, and the other is all but 30 minutes out. We say thanks and then kill the radio, then collectively look back down at the light waiting for us. What the hell is that? I couldn't help but ask. I was the janitor guy on our team, and my experience just got the best of me. It turned out no one had a good answer, and we were all a little rattled. Even the park ranger, and he lived here. But just as we begin to descend again, the light clicks off, totally disappears. No moment, no flicker, no fade, just gone. We all shook our heads and pushed into the darkness. A couple of us actually turned on additional headlamps and handlights, just in spite of the light that vanished. We hit the area that we estimated the light had to have been positioned, but there isn't any evidence of anything. There's no trash there, no litter, smoke, tracks, or anything else. We even scanned the trees just to be sure. We all had shared that feeling that I would call dread. All four of us were talking about how we couldn't wait to get off the mountain. The anxiety was almost palpable. I got to talking with another volunteer. We got a little distracted as we walked. We were comparing thoughts on that weird crashing that we'd heard earlier, and the weirder lights coming and going below us. The other guy was probably the most freaked out out of any of us and was totally convinced both events were correlated. He thought human traffickers got the guy at first, then Bigfoot once we heard the crashing and now UFOs with the light vanishing. His theories were all over the place, but I wanted to backboard some ideas off somebody. Meanwhile, the ranger and the other guy got ahead of us about 100 yards. As we're hiking along, a loud sound emits from the tree stand to our left and both our little groups immediately stop. Me and the other guy start hustling to catch up, speed walking as quickly as possible as the terrain will allow us to. Just as we're closing the last 50 yards, both me and the other volunteer stop in our tracks again. There was another sound to our left, but this one was so much closer, so close that only he and I could hear it. Someone, very faintly in the trees, whispered, Hey, at us. It was so quiet, but so clear. We had no choice but to freeze. Who was trying to get our attention at one in the morning in the middle of nowhere? We can't help but turn around and look. And here's where it gets a little speculative, because he and I didn't see the same thing. From where I was positioned a few feet behind him and to the right, and he had a direct line of sight. We both stand there for a minute before this guy yelps and cries out, then totally collapses into the underbrush. We both were just standing there for a minute, and then all of a sudden, this guy yelps and cries out, totally collapses into the underbrush. He's backpedaling as fast as he can, scrambling on all fours like a crab. His lights are cutting in every direction, which leads to the chaos and prevents me from seeing anything further than him falling down. I help him to his feet, just as the ranger and the other volunteers come running over. They both had guns drawn, clearly way more prepared than myself. They asked what happened, to which I just looked at the guy I was talking to and shrugged. We explained the first part together, that we heard someone whisper hey, and then all three of us listened to the rest. He says he turned to the trees after the whisper. He was looking back and forth along the trunks. He was expecting someone to step out from somewhere 10 feet away, based on the sound of the voice. As he's looking, he sees movement, but nothing he expected. He said a person began crawling on the forest floor, quickly, and moving right toward him. He said they were only five or six feet away, but right in front of him, looking straight up. He had seen their eyes reflecting on the light the whole time, but just thought it was sap. It wasn't. It was some muddled naked weirdo. They blended into the dirt and pine needles perfectly, and by the time the guy got to his feet, that person was gone. We did a sweep of the area called out a few more times, but found no sign of anyone. It was cool weather for the season, so a naked person like that would have had to have been on drugs. It was the only thing that explained the behavior. The whole thing was crazy because I sure as hell heard that whisper too, so it's not beyond the realm of possibility for there to be a person to go with that voice. After finding nothing, we kept pushing down the mountain. 
but now with a real drive to get the hell out of those woods. We're all but spilling over one another, all asses and elbows in a bid not to be last. No one wanted to be the one with darkness chasing behind them. The ranger radioed down, asked if there were any other missing persons in that area for the night, but of course, nothing. Mission is over. He doesn't bother reporting whatever the volunteers saw. We all just agree to tell them when we got back. It takes us much less time now that we're huffing toward the command post. We didn't see anything else, and after we made our report, a second team was almost dispatched to go have a look, but ultimately was called off. If there was anyone else, they'd have to be called in first. Never heard anything else about the light or that creepy crawler in the woods, but it for sure made one crazy ass night. I've worked as a pack trip outfitter, ranch hand in the middle of the national forest, and spent at least a week each month camping. I'm doing dog mushing now, so I'm outdoors now in times when it's colder and darker, and further into places that people don't often go. Most people would consider a 25 mile horse trip to be very long. In fact, it would probably be all day. I'll do from 40 to 80 miles a day to get the dogs in shape for the Iditarod and Yukon quest. I'm not directly with search and rescue or with the park rangers, but I volunteered alongside them both, spent countless hours assisting them inside the deep wilderness. I've never met a person that didn't log these kind of miles who didn't see or hear some unbelievable stuff. It's par for the course, but just how much of it you entertain is up to you. I don't believe in half the stuff I hear about, mostly just what I see with my own eyes. My story that I'm going to tell you is a two-parter, with the first part being just past the New Mexican border into Arizona. I was driving on old county highways and the sun had just slipped into dusk. In between the light makes it harder to judge shadows and distances. It's when most accidents happen. I'm not driving that fast, I'm just going the speed limit because I'm in the middle of nowhere. If I clip something, it's gonna be a while before anyone finds me, if I even survive at all. Once the sun is totally gone, I plan on picking the speed back up. That's when I see five or six elk cows burst onto the road, and I slam onto the brakes and swerve all the way off the shoulder. I almost collided with rocks and all kinds of stuff along the road, rather than hit this herd. It's almost a certain death sentence to collide with one of those animals. They stand six or seven feet tall, weigh over 500 pounds, and they breed like rabbits in some places. I might survive hitting one, but all five? No way. Luckily for me though, I dodged them but I still almost hit this one elk that was bigger than all the rest. It looked like it was going to hit me straight on and crash into me through the front windshield, killing me instantly. Like I heard happen to some guy in Deming when he hit a horse. It was one of the worst deaths I could imagine. Hard, fast, and then just being crushed to death. The glass would probably shred me too. I felt this really calm feeling and thought it would be the end. Everything felt slow. I got a good look at it. It's so weird how natural it is to surrender when death feels unavoidable. Many of us have this idea that we're going to go out swinging, but the truth is, we accept it when it's coming. The only scary part was that it was looking back at me too. It was about the size of a moose. It had no antlers of any kind, and the build of a typical female. The other animals were common elk cows, but this one was larger and covered from head to toe in what looked like large gray wool like an angora goat that needed shaving so bad that it started to look like dreadlocks. And by larger, you have to understand the dimensions. An elk can average 500 pounds, but a female moose averages closer to 900. This animal lumbering along with the herd was twice the size of any animals, to put into perspective. And the elk were already bigger than my car. No wonder it was so hard to avoid. It literally took up every inch of the two lane road that I was on. Luckily I get past it though, I see its head go over the roof of my shitty Ford Taurus, and then it hit the back of my car. The part I remember best is passing under it, because for one instant, I felt this weird connection with this thing, like we knew that we were looking at one another, despite the dead grey wads of fur hanging in its face. I skirted to a stop and jumped out of the car immediately, despite my better judgement. I was standing in awe, I needed to see what the hell that thing was. The elk were moving into the tree line and whatever I saw was right behind them. 
everything just disappeared into the brush. I walk back to the front of my car to inspect the place where I hid it, and sure enough, there's a brand new dent in the middle. I leaned on my car with my hands on my head for like 20 minutes, just replaying it over and over in disbelief. My friends think it was some kind of Sasquatch, even though I'm certain it had four legs, so we'll just call it Bigfoot's horse. My wife says it was probably the spirit of death, and that I died there but continued living on in what my mind wants to happen. The second part is that I was a few miles up the ridge that overlooked Lake Strawberry in Utah. I got to this old aspen grove, with really thick aspens on both sides. I mention this because with a string of 12 dogs behind an ATV, as there wasn't enough snow for the sleds, there's really nowhere to go but forward. You couldn't guide the dogs through the trees like that, so it was always forward until we got to the end of the loop that would bring us back to the trail and then back to base camp. Which was an exciting thought, because I'm usually using a headlamp, and it was late and cold. We'd more than accomplished the routes that I wanted to that day. Now, it was just about getting back. Suddenly, I saw it again, running on my left side. It was going in the same direction as us, but also toward us at an angle. If we kept going, we would collide after about 50 yards. Again, I was reminded of the magnificent power of the moose. This thing was just barreling through two or three foot snow drifts like they were nothing. The amount of strength it showed was unreal and it was matted in that same thick fur as the other one from Arizona. That's the first thing that came to my mind. The other one I saw was a few years before and roughly 900 miles away. There's no way I was looking at that same creature that I saw in the Arizona backcountry. This was a different thing up here in the Utah high country. I wish I would have grabbed a camera, but I was caught up in the franticness of watching my dogs to make sure they didn't chase toward it. In dog mushing, you can never take your eyes off your leader too long, or something can go terribly wrong. And to stop the team would make them for sure go toward it, and get caught in the trees. So really, the best thing you can do was just go faster. Keep the dogs busy so they don't chase. This also meant I might put some distance between myself and whatever the hell that thing is. It still was crashing through snowbanks and branches as it galloped through the tundra. There's only 25 yards between us and a few sparse trees, bare of any leaves or cover. So I'm looking at it, at the pack leader, ahead of the team, because a fallen tree or cattle guard taken too fast can injure a dog just like a moose. I look back at the creature, then reach in around my emergency bag, then look back at the leader, pull out my just-in-case gun. It's a six-shot 357 revolver with buffalo bore cartridges. I click off the first two chambers I keep empty. I have the gun pointed straight up in the air with live ammo now. I really didn't want to shoot it, or even frighten the dogs with a gunshot, but it keeps getting close, so I fire a shot a few feet above it, and hear the bullet hit some branches, and then look back at the dogs. Just as I do that, I see it go behind a thick grove of trees in my periphery. I kept looking around, but that was the last I saw of it, although the rest of the ride I was jumping at shadows. As a hunter, dog sledder, and volunteer search and rescue guide, I still don't know what to make of it. It's got four legs and what looks like decades worth of coat growth and doesn't need to be able to see to move. It shouldn't exist, yet I've seen it twice. Pretty crazy, but the craziest thing was that tiny moment I thought, oh shit, it's death again, but this time, he's gonna take me for real. I worked in Big Bend National Park back when I was a kid. We were prepping for a backpacking series presentation for REI. This was a big event for the company and other outdoorsy companies, mostly photographers, who were going to come and test the equipment, and then showcase their own. We were tasked with securing a large campsite for them that had to meet certain parameters. They needed views of the sunrise and sunset, needed to be near flowing water, and they didn't want another camper within three miles of them. Big Bend is in the western portion of Texas that dips down along the bend of the Rio Grande that forms the border with Mexico. It's mixed high desert, smaller mountains, has great history, just for anyone unclear on the region. Since we work the park, we know which places are busier than others, which campsites have access to better vantage points. We set out in a couple of teams to go survey the areas to see which would be best. It didn't take long, thankfully. 
and left us with a free afternoon. REI offered to let us test some of the equipment on ship, but beyond that, we stayed mostly uninvolved. We broke up into groups based on interest. Pretty much everyone wanted to swim, a couple of guys wanted to fish, and then there was a trail system nearby that I'd been meaning to check out. I was hiking the area near a place we dubbed the Unknown Canyon. This was on account of a series of random grave markers found along the canyon floor, all chiseled with a single date, and then simply the words, unknown person or unknown child. It sounds far more nefarious than it really is. Early road makers discovered corpses in the area that they accidentally disturbed while digging into the mountainside. Rather than scatter them into the elements, they took careful measures to relocate the remains to a beautiful little glen throughout the valley. This is why they had stone and mortar to make the headstones. It's a cool, creepy piece of the history around here. This was so long ago, and I'm sure the canyon has a different name now. The area of the park opens up into a comparatively flat section of the basin, where the river broadens and the wildlife tends to be more diverse and obvious there. It was a mild, safe area for me to poke around with my camera. I didn't have to worry about getting tripped up or needing a free hand. I even snapped a couple of photos of the unknown gravestones that I came across. I was several hundred meters away from the ranger truck, which was parked in a designated lot at what passed for our trailhead at the time. This area was open to guests and visitors, but wasn't easily accessed by your average hiker. You needed to know which creek to follow, and then which game trail to splinter off, and a portion of the descent is almost straight up and down if you don't know how to properly navigate it. As I approached the river basin near the mouth of the canyon, I saw something really unusual. So unusual, in fact, that it took a few seconds for my brain to sort that puzzle. Something was moving on the other side of the river, and it was big, man-sized, but low to the ground. As it shuffled along, the color of it made me think it was a group of rabbits, but there was no way, it was too big. As I moved forward to improve my visual on it, it began to look even stranger. For a second, I thought I was looking at a medium-sized deer doing the worm across the canyon floor. I must be hallucinating. There's no other options. Only after blinking and refocusing my eyes can I behold exactly what I'm seeing. It was a mountain lion, a big cat. It was creeping along, low slung, hunting something that was probably no more than a stone's throw from where I was standing. I'd never seen one before, and when the visual information finally parsed, I think my blood froze. Then, it looked at me. And I'll probably never forget that bit. You could see the little calorie calculator turn on in its eyes. I've never been so thankful for a river in my entire life. Granted at this time, and even maybe still, the river was very low due to drought and unauthorized and unlawful irrigation practices upstream. And you could likely cross at several points at this location with very minimal risk. It was still quite broad and definitely looked the part of a potent water barrier though. The cat does a series of double takes, head shifting to me, then to the prey's location, back and forth rapidly. I could actually see it weighing the risk versus the reward, trying to get a fix on this evening's menu. I died a little inside, maintained my facing and began slowly and quietly moving away from it. I do have bear spray on my belt, but I have little to no confidence being before such a predator. Not sure if I wasn't worth it or if the river was too much of an X factor, or if the biggin just really wasn't that into me. But no chase was given, and after breaking the line of sight, I was able to get back to the van just fine with no sign of pursuit. That was the longest short walk I've ever taken. Later on that night, I was parked off the main park road in the area where big cats commonly hunted. I'll always remember being parked there, in the middle of nowhere, munching on slightly stale Oreos and a bottle of water listening to the occasional growl or scream of a big cat peel out of the darkness, and being thankful for my relatively fortunate position on our food chain. I was hiking with a group, spread out naturally based on hiking speed. We were on a day training hike that would take us to the next station over. I was in the middle of a group of four, and one person had to stop to pull a tick off. The other two, one being a lead ranger, stayed with them. I decided to hike ahead and see if I could catch up with the lead group. 
The trail we were on is extremely well marked, so I wasn't worried about getting lost. I left them behind for a fear of the ticks. In my mind, where there's one, there's 10,000 more hanging in the leaves around you. Despite my choice of career and pastimes, ticks and leeches are some of my top fears. I didn't want to be the next one having to burn them off my neck and thighs. I knew the next landmark was an old logging road, and sure enough, I hit it about a half a mile later. I decided I should wait for the rest of the group and catch up. So while waiting, I hiked a bit down the old overgrown road, which ran perpendicular to the trail. There was a low stone wall along one side that I was just strolling alongside it, checking for anything interesting like artifacts and stuff like that. Then all of a sudden, it felt like I just crossed this invisible line. It was like the sound cut off too. No birds or insects called. Seconds ago, there had been multiple birds singing. Even leaves on the trees around me stopped rustling. It was just this sudden, unnatural, deafening silence. For whatever reason, I took a few more hesitant steps until I hit this invisible wall. I was suddenly barraged by this feeling, and I can only describe it as this intense, unwelcome feeling, as if I'd entered the house of someone I knew that hated me, but multiplied by a hundred. All the hairs on my body stood straight up. I stopped dead in my tracks. That feeling was so strong that I didn't even want to turn my back. I couldn't see anything down the road, nothing threatening or otherwise, that would give me all these feelings, but I knew I had to leave there immediately. I just knew I was not meant to be there. If I stayed, something bad would happen. So I started walking backwards, slowly, never turning away from the road, and trying really hard not to even blink. Finally, I crossed that invisible line again. I could hear the birds singing and the leaves rustling. I didn't turn around until I heard the leader I'd left earlier asking me if there was anything cool down that road. I was like, nope, let's keep going. Looking back, I figure it was just a bear or a cougar, maybe out of sight, and my instincts managed to pick up on it. But at the time, damn, it was just a really creepy feeling, almost paranormal. I let the rest of the team know, but everyone generally just let it slide, what we were going to do go hike around until we found it? There's animals in the woods, it's that simple. We reached the next station and had a really cool weekend, learning about various plant life and field triage training. I completely forgot about that weird experience in the forest, and when anyone asked, just said it was the time I thought I was close to a predator. It wasn't until next summer when I had to complete the same hike to that same station with a different team of rangers. Half of them were vets, people that had worked and lived in that park for more than 10 years. The hike was a breeze because all of us newbies got to ask questions and hear wild stories. One of the older rangers, I'll just call him Rick, had a bunch of stories of run-ins with different predators. It reminded me of last year when I had that creepy experience in the woods. I spoke up and told my story, how it happened and on this exact trail, how much it lined up with Rick's encounters, how everything got still and how loud your heartbeat sounded in the moment. But when I told him about the vibe, Rick didn't really comment. The conversation then got redirected. We started talking about something else. I thought that was kind of weird, and when I looked at him, he had this faraway look. He gave me this weird nod when he noticed me looking at him, like we would talk later. Sure enough, when we reached the station and broke camp for that day, Rick came to find me. He apologized for clamming up and explained he wanted to speak in private. I said okay and we moved off, made a little distance between us and the rest of the group. The first thing he asked was where exactly I thought my story happened. I told him where I went, the old overgrown road. Rick told me he'd also explored that road in both directions. One way was a dead end after a quarter mile, where a rock slide had completely erased wherever the road once led. It looked more like an old stagecoach pass that way, with matching ruts chewed into the earth. Another year, he explored it the other way, the same direction I did. Rick said he followed the low rock wall until he found a nice place to relax for a bit, but found himself overwhelmed with the same feelings of dread. It wasn't just silent and eerie. Rick said it was like every fiber of his being was screaming at him to walk the other way. He got out of there, but was way more perplexed about what he felt than I was. I'd never encountered predators, so I didn't really know what to expect. Rick had, and this wasn't like being near a bear or a lion. 
It was like there was something in the air telling him to run. Nothing instinctual, but actually suggestive somehow. It reminded Rick of something he heard about. Rick had served briefly in the US Army before coming a park ranger. During his service, he'd heard about various military technologies, a lot of them partially confidential because of their experimental nature. One thing he'd heard about was a non-lethal energy weapon called an access denial system. This was something that could be carried or installed somewhere and would emit waves at a certain frequency and make any environment uninhabitable. If one of these was placed above a doorway, for example, you would not be able to pass through it until it was turned off. You wouldn't be able to tell why, but something would subconsciously keep you from wanting to enter. Just like how we felt when we went down that road. Rick had always been fascinated with government technologies, and because he had a back catalog of knowledge, he was actually able to deduce exactly what we felt. He explained it in a way that clicked. It did feel like a frequency. Something all around me when I stepped into it. My desire to go back the way I came was palpable. I was excited. I asked him what we did next. Who could we take that information to? I'll never forget the defeated half smile that he gave me as he patted me on the shoulder. He said there was nothing we could do. He'd tried once and gotten nowhere. At the end of the day, who do you take that kind of story to? The police? The press? There's no way to prove your story, and as you say it, you sound a little crazy. I was in complete disbelief. He just wanted to compare notes with me and clue me in on what his theory was. That whatever was at the end of that old road was supposed to be classified, I guess. Rick said there have been a number of people over the years making the same report, and no investigation ever happens. Most of them were in the southwest, whereas we were a little farther north. Either way, what did it matter? He also explained that investigating too much was a mistake. He followed a story or two, where some of these folks who'd made reports ended up disappearing after going back to see what was out there. I only worked at the park for another year before transferring, but I've never forgotten what happened that day. I was working as a camp worker when this happened to me. Other than just me, there was a Navajo guy there my age also working. We'll call him Josh. Our job was to look after the horses and campers, make food, and keep the site clean for the next set of campers. The company that we worked for had emergency rifles set up in the trailer that we used, along with two guard dogs. The most common visitors that we had were forest rangers. They'd come by periodically, every couple of days at least, and check on long-term campsites. We were on a first-name basis with these guys, would usually have a pot of coffee waiting for them whenever they rolled through. Working in the wilderness, it's nice to have some sporadic company. Almost makes it feel normal. One night after a long trail ride, we'd gone back to camp only to discover there was a single coyote patrolling it. We watched it from a distance before it saw us and then scurried off. I don't know why, but Josh had this really bad feeling after seeing it. The other workers didn't really seem bothered, but they weren't the ones who had to live on the site 24-7 like we did. Maybe it was just nerves, but both of us had this feeling of being watched that entire evening. So eventually, night comes and we all fall asleep. We wake up to a banging on our door and someone wailing outside. We get up to investigate. Josh goes and checks the blinds. He sees it's a camper and he lets them in. They come inside and they're completely terrified. They tell us that one of the girls that they were with had heard a sound which sounded like one of her friends outside her only to step on her as she was making her way outside of the tent. That's when the wailing began, which woke all of them up. It apparently had gone on for 20 or so minutes before they came to wake us up. As they're telling us this, the wailing stops, then promptly starts back up in a different spot, much closer to the camping site. This time, we notice the dogs are with us bristling, so both of us are not being very brave. We took down the rifle and exited the trailer. We brought the dogs with us, leashed, and let them lead us to the center of camp. From here, you could tell the sound was coming from just beyond the edge of lantern light, where the area was pitch black. We gather some of the wood sitting next to us, start the fire back up, and that's when it gets bad. 
I've never been more terrified in my life than when I was right now. As soon as the wood catches, from all around us, the wailing stops. The dog just stands next to us, growling really hard, but their tails are tucked. They know they're outgunned. I had absolutely no idea what was going on, so I chambered around into my rifle, in which my friend follows suit. After that, it goes dead quiet, and I mean dead quiet, like no sound being heard whatsoever. I don't know if it was from how scared I was or what, but the next thing I know, I hear my name being whispered from the tree line to my left. I'll fully admit it, I pissed my pants. It was and still the most terrifying moment of my entire life. I look at my friend. He's wide-eyed and his face is pale. He's looking between me and where my name had come from, just as terrified as I was, maybe if not more. We both back up closer to the campfire before he takes one of the burning branches and hurls it towards the tree stand. At this point, what few campers had followed us out into the dark are completely losing their minds. A couple of them heard the voice as well and saw us tossing flaming branches into the shadows, rifles raised. They can all tell something is very wrong. I look back at them for only a second, just in time to see them backpedal into the trailer and then slam the door. Not very cool, but I get it. We hear a weird sound and see something scurry away, only to have the dogs go completely ballistic. If there was anything left in my bladder at that point, it had come out. Just as I begin to take a step forward, I hear another voice. This time, it whispers Josh's name from straight ahead. It even said his full name. I look at my friend, but we're frozen. He points at something making its way slowly toward us. He points his rifle and fires at it, hitting whatever it was. After the initial shot, we kind of went crazy, firing at whatever made a sound inside that brush. The thing that we saw stalking out of the foliage was tall, person-sized. Everything we thought we saw after that was crawling. So we stayed outside of the trailer for the rest of that night until the other workers came up. They see us both, tired, still clutching the rifles, and ask what the hell happened. We go over everything and they go out to investigate. One of them had a radio and contacted the forest rangers. The green truck came bumping out of the forest no more than an hour later. By noon, they came back with two dead coyotes. Apparently, what happened was the current set of campers had brought a large amount of meat to grill with, but hadn't properly sealed the containers, attracting the coyote pack. I definitely had some fantastical things going through my brain, ranging from skinwalkers to ghosts. To see the actual creature causing it all was completely surreal. The forest rangers noted the strangest part. One of the coyotes was very clearly dead from the massive bullet hole in its side from one of our rifles. The other coyote, however, didn't have any visible wounds, definitely no bullet holes. Its face was locked in a crazy snarl and all of its muscles were tense to the point of rigidity. No idea what killed it, like it just dropped dead during the onslaught. Josh was particularly spooked when he saw them and refused to tell me why. I suspect it had something to do with his personal beliefs, possibly Navajo culture, but I don't want to assume. The only thing he told me was that there should be a third corpse, the big standing thing he shot right in the chest, but there's nothing around. Coyotes can't talk. We both heard our names whispered that night. The amount of gore throughout the area was unbelievable. Blood and innards painted the ground, bushes, and even up and down trees. Josh said it looked like there was something among the pack, fighting them. Maybe that's what actually got them in a frenzy. The rangers took down a report, but never got back to us with any more information. In 2016, my boyfriend, who's now my husband and I, went camping in eastern Pennsylvania. The place we decided to stop for the night was primitive. Camping was free, but no cell phone service, barely a road. We did encounter two other people. They might not factor into what happened later at all, but they were creepy, so I'm going to describe them. The first was a woman who had her truck off to the side of the road, just as we drove past. She had the hood open and seemed to be waiting for someone to stop and offer to help. Usually, my boyfriend had no problem helping someone. But he said this time, something about her just put him off. She 
She didn't really seem like she needed help. And usually people who need help look at you hopefully as you approach. She looked like she was just expecting that we would stop. At least that's what my boyfriend said. I really didn't notice anything strange about her. The next person came when we chose a spot and were setting up a fire for some hot dogs. I noticed some people drive by a few times, but my boyfriend pointed out each time was the same car and the same man watching us each time he passed. My boyfriend was a little uneasy about this, but we'd driven around for a while before finding a place that we liked. It had been raining, everything was muddy. We wanted the driest sight possible. He could have easily been doing the same thing. We briefly thought about moving, but the road was muddy too. If he wanted to find us again if we moved, all he had to do was follow the tracks. There were some other tracks, but not really many. He'd only have to backtrack a little to locate us once more. He didn't come by another time though, so we stayed and spent the several remaining hours before dark just goofing off. We didn't see anyone else drive by. Whether or not those two had anything else to do with this experience, the real fear came later. We'd gone to sleep in our tent, and sometime around 3 a.m., we were awoken by this very loud noise. I can't describe it very well, or even remember exactly what it sounded like, but my boyfriend said it reminded him of a chain gun revving up. It also sounded similar to how it would sound if someone recorded a shovel being dragged over gravel and played it over a loudspeaker, is another way he described it. He jumped up and looked out our little window, but couldn't really see anything. The sound repeated itself a few more times. I was too scared to speak. My boyfriend whispered it was probably miles off and just to go back to sleep. I didn't question him. I figured loud sounds could easily be heard miles off. But after we ended up leaving, he told me it sounded like it actually had been coming from just down the road, but didn't want to freak me out. Looking back, I probably should have wondered why he would bother to whisper if that sound was far off. I was still terrified though. Every little thing I heard outside sounded like someone was walking around the tent. We laid there for a little while longer when finally, he told me to get dressed because we're leaving. Immediately I got alarmed and then I grew more alarmed when he unwrapped the machete that we brought for this trip from its plastic and then exited the tent. We quickly packed up and loaded the car. I looked around for footprints that weren't our own but despite the moon providing plenty of light, I really couldn't see any. I did point out something my boyfriend hadn't noticed though before we got back into the car. There's a beer can by our dead fire that hadn't been there before. We didn't even bring beer. While driving away, my boyfriend explained that he was nervous someone might have been trying to lure us out, so he didn't think it was a good idea to run from the tent right away. He also half expected to find our gas tank had been siphoned dry, but, but that wouldn't have stopped us because thankfully we had a hybrid car. We joked that it would make a funny hybrid commercial, number of brutal murders avoided by driving a hybrid. I think joking was the only thing keeping us from shitting ourselves from the fear and the adrenaline alone. On our way out, we did get a little lost, so it ended up taking a lot longer to get back to the forest road. We ended up passing into the national forest, which I guess we were in the whole time, where we passed a ranger station. The light was on and we needed directions anyway, so I decided to report what happened to us. The rangers were friendly enough, totally understood our concern. In fact, they've been having a number of people stop in with similar accounts. When we explained where we come from and had set up camp, they said it made sense. That area of forest was easily more accessible from the highway, so it was known for less than desirable activity. We thanked the rangers and then went on our merry way. The rest of our trip, we only stayed in well-populated campsites or got a hotel.